I am going to call to order this meeting of the Town of Hingham Select Board on March 8th, 2022. The time is 6.04. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. Is there anyone else recording this meeting? I see none. I will note for the record that members of the select board participating this evening are Bill Ramsey, Liz Klein, and myself, Joe Fisher. The first item on our agenda for this evening is to consider approval of the minutes. And we are looking at the minutes of March 1st, 2022. I am prepared to proceed. Bill and Liz. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to accept the motion then. I make a motion to approve the minutes dated March 1st, 2022. Second. Roll call vote, Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe, aye. They are approved. Next item on our agenda is to consider approval of the collective, collective bargaining agreement with the Hingham Library Staff Association, SEIU Local 888. And I believe we have, I saw David Pace, uh, and I'm not sure I saw Courtney Orwig, is she with us? Um, don't don't see her. Don't see her, Joe. Would, would you prefer that we wait? Um, no, that's okay. So then, uh, David, if you don't mind uh, putting us through our paces uh, and giving us a summary uh, for our consideration, and we welcome you to our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Sure, the, this is the final agreement, the actual formal collective bargaining agreement with the libraries union. Um, we had discussed and, and approved a memorandum of agreement with the libraries union, I think back in December, maybe a little earlier, kind of memorializing the negotiations um, to give a top line, you know, which we went through in detail back then. Um, it, the agreement provides for a equity adjustment to the compensation for the union members, as well as a 3% general wage increase. Um, it also recognizes or includes Juneteenth as an official holiday um, and extends uh, a fifth week of vacation to um, members of the uh, employees of the library who've been there for five years. So both of which are consistent with the um, uh, town bylaw and changes we made to the town bylaw. Uh, overall, I think the negotiations, is, as in the past with library, were very uh, collaborative, very fruitful, and just wanted to just give a, a thank you both to the select board and, and the town administration for their support, but also to the library union um, for, for their conduct and integrity and kind of honesty that they went through this agreement and with the goal to move quickly to reach uh, a good agreement. I think um, everybody came away very happy with the result, so. And am I correct that this agreement is retroed back to July 1st of 2021? Correct, correct. The old agreement expired uh, as of June 30th, 2021. So this one will be effective as of July 1, 21, and will be for three years, a three-year term. Great. Um, Liz Klein, questions or comments? Thank you, David. I know we went through this in detail, so and, and nothing's changed since then. So uh, no questions. Thank you. Bill Ramsey. No additional questions. I uh, appreciate the work, David, you and Courtney did on this uh, CBA. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Are there members of the public with comments or questions concerning the uh, collective bargaining agreement with the Hingham Library Staff Association? I see none. So I am prepared to accept the motion. I will make a motion to sign the collective bargaining agreement with the Hingham Library Staff Association, Local 888, SEIU, AFL-CIO, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2024. Second. Roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe. Aye. It is approved. Um, 
looking, do we yet have uh, Tom Mayo joining us? Um, I do not see him. Art, I do see you. Um, do you know where uh, where Tom is? He is he is in the building. He is in the office. If you'll bear with me. I will I will check his. The next item on our agenda is to consider approval of the agreement with Energized Advisors LLC to assist in the development of a climate action plan for the town of Hingham. I saw Kathy Riley. Is Brad Moyer here as well? There he is, Brad. Good I am Joe. You. Good to see you, Joe. Um, so if uh, Kathy, do you want to take the lead or have Brad do that? Um, I'm um, open sure. to your suggestion. I, I'll be happy to do it. Um, and Brad can certainly chime in. Um, we are uh, requesting the approval of um, the climate action plan uh, plan consultant, right? Uh, so um, we issued an RFP um, for a consultant for the climate action plan. Um, that was approved at town meeting last uh, in last year's annual town meeting. Um, we received uh, four bids and the evaluation team reviewed them. Uh, it, it, the team consisted of a subgroup of the climate action planning committee. Uh, they uh, made a recommendation to the full committee. The committee voted uh, to recommend a company named Energy ZT and in the amount of $80,000, which was the amount anticipated um, and reserved for that, um, uh, for that purpose. So- I think, uh, Can you talk about where the funds will be coming from? Sure, the, um, the municipal, Hingham Municipal Light Plant and the town um, had an agreement last year, um, uh, pending um, town meeting approval, which it subsequent, subsequently was, uh, to um, that the HMLP would provide eighty thousand uh, dollars from their budget um, to pay for this consultant to develop a the the town's climate action plan, and so um, we're requesting that you approve um, pending uh, the receipt of the eighty thousand dollars from HMLP to the town, um, and then the contract. Will be, be, will begin if you approve it. Uh, Brad, anything you wanted to add? Um, I can add nothing, a little or a lot. <laughs> so I, I'll, I don't I'll start with I'll start, start with a little. I'll start with a little. I'll start with a little. Well, first off, uh, I want to thank Kathy. Kathy's been a fantastic partner through all of this, guiding the team uh, through uh, the process. And with her help, I thought we got very. Uh, four very strong submissions. Um, the evaluation team in evaluating the proposals, what brought and I've I've heard two new versions of how to pronounce this company's name, and I promise you we've had three or four of our own. So I'm going to call it Energist because that's what we seem to have landed on, but there are multiple <laughs> other options. Yep. But um, the what led uh, us to select Energist as our top choice is that in the ranking criteria they were had the strongest references and recommendations uh, particularly at the local level uh, so this consists of individuals um, from the Cohasset area uh, Tanya uh, has many years as uh, Cohasset's chair of their alternative energy uh, committee um, and knows uh, folks in, in Hingham and Cohasset very well and has strong recommendations and references. Another individual, Jenny LeClaire, used to be on the Energy Action Committee uh, many years ago. She was the uh, first sustainability director uh, hired in Dedham and was instrumental in 
uh, developing their plans and, and they were a pioneer in the greater Boston area and the work that they've done over the years. Uh, and again, very strong recommendations uh, for her and the work that the group has done. Uh, they had a, a solid uh, proposal put together, uh, excellent community engagement strategy, which we considered key uh, to the effectiveness of any climate action plan uh, and, and their knowledge of the Massachusetts marketplace uh, for technologies, grants, and other opportunities uh, was uh, in the lead of the other uh, proposals that we received. So on that, we thought that they were the, the top contender. Great. Um, thank you. I, I just want to, just to provide the context, and I know Kathy mentioned this, but just, just reading very briefly from last year's town meeting, Article 13, the question was, Will the town vote to raise and appropriate borrow transfer or uh, from available funds, a sum of money to be spent by the town for the purpose of creating a climate action plan, which will evaluate a wide range of carbon emission reduction strategies and propose measures within the town of Hingham to achieve a zero sum of carbon emissions produced and take out of the atmosphere, quote, net zero by the year 2040 or another target deemed feasible or act on anything related thereto. And this action is consistent with and is in furtherance of Article 13 from the last town meeting. Um, Liz Klein, any uh, comments or questions? Sure, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just curious, did the other three bids come in around 80,000? Is that kind of the standard price for this scope or? Yeah, so in the, we uh, in the RFP included the budget amount, okay. and the lowest bid received was 78000 The next lowest bid was $79,724.51, which was an <laughs> astounding figure to me. We'll talk about precision. Um, and then the other two were both at 80000 So you were talking at most a 2.5% differential. Got it. Okay. And what is the timeline for the, the consultant to do the plan? Sure. So in the RFP, we put for three timelines that we were shooting for. The first was to have the contours of the plan sufficiently developed by September 30th of this year. The rationale for that date is we wanted to know in advance whether there was anything in our plan that may require um, action at town meeting. So we wanted to know by September 30th so that we could sufficiently develop uh, and move forward to putting forward a warrant article recommendation before select board and advisory. The next date was to have a rough draft of the plan completed by December 31st of this year. Uh, that way we could have an opportunity to submit it around for comments and receive comments uh, before town meeting. Again, if any action would need to be taken for the plan at town meeting. And then lastly, we just have a final draft of the plan by March 31st of 2023. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. And just following up, I note for the record that the contract has that March 31st, 2023 deadline in it as when the deliverables need to be provided. So thank you. Bill, any comments or questions? Brad, appreciate your all the work you've been doing and uh, putting this together. Um, Sorry if I missed it, has, has this um, company, have they done any plans for any other communities? Yeah, so that was one of the things that we requested of each of the respondents. Um, and Energist um, of our top two was the closest to having similar plans. So what do I mean by that comment? While the company itself did not have um, a climate action plan it could point us to for work that it's done. Energist as a company is a collection of consultants who work in this space. So the respondents, uh, or I should say, the individuals who will be doing the work in their individual capacity has each done this type of work in the past uh, for different communities. So while the company itself doesn't have a climate action plan to point us to, the individuals have worked on climate action planning. So we felt confidence in their capabilities. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and has the money been transferred over from Hingham Light yet or we're still waiting on it? Uh, uh, Bill, that the money has not been transferred over yet. Uh, okay. But the, the, um, the vote will in fact 
provide that uh, the execution of this contract will be contingent upon the town's receipt of those funds. Oh, got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Good point. Any members of the public with questions or comments? Seeing none, I am prepared to take a motion and just make sure that we're looking at the latest motion sheet for this motion. <clears throat> I make a motion to authorize the town administrator to sign the agreement with Energy ZT Advisors LLC to assist in the development of a climate action plan for the town of Hingham in an amount not to exceed $80,000 subject to receipt of sufficient funds from the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant. Second. Roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe. Aye. We are approved. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Much appreciated. Really, pre really appreciate your, your work here. Uh, and mm -hmm. thank you, Kathy. Um, next item on our agenda is a discussion of the 2022 Annual Town Meeting Warrant Article BBB, Zoning Bylaw Requirements for Accessory Uses. And I believe we have a guest appearance by Emily Wentworth to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Emily, are you there? There you are. I do. Hello. Good evening. Actually, Good um, we have a more prestigious uh, guest appearance from the chair of the zoning board, Robin McGuire. Oh. Um, the, the zoning board initiated this Warren article, um, and Robin uh, would be happy to give you a little bit of background on the intent. Great. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Joe, and thanks, Emily. I don't know about the more prestigious part that Emily just said, but I'm happy to give you some background on this article. Um, so this is article BBB, Requirements for Accessory Uses. And um, this is an article, as she said, that's put forth by the Zoning Board of Appeals. As you probably all can relate, the pandemic provided greater opportunity for residents in Hingham to conduct activities from their home and permitted accessory uses in connection with a principal single or two family dwelling use has included resident offices, studi studios or customary home occupations. And most home based businesses can be operated without impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Um, however, over the course of the pandemic, the zoning board has seen some potential to cause disruption to the neighborhood. And for that reason, we're putting forth this um, article. Section 3J of the zoning bylaw regulates accessory uses and requires that accessory uses, quote, shall not alter, alter the character of the premises on which they are located or impair the neighborhood. And the board, after review of a recent application um, for administrative appeal related to an accessory use, noted that more specific parameters would help um, the building department as well as the zoning board with respect to the administration of the bylaw. So the primary amendment supported uh, unanimously by the zoning board and the planning board adds certain factors for consideration by the building commissioner as the zoning enforcement officer and the board to assess the character and neighborhood impacts. And if you, um, I don't know if you have the uh, proposed article in front of you, but if you look we at it. We do. Okay. If you look at it, you can see that um, uh, we've listed- Robin, if I can, if I can just interrupt. Uh, Michelle, do you want to put that up on the- screen so that we can all okay. track that together. Sorry, Robin. No problem. How's that? Thanks very much. So Emily may have more to say about this and may want to walk through this um, in some more detail, but you can see that um, specific to the factors that are listed to be considered potential impairment to the neighborhood, we've listed noise, light, odor, sound, traffic congestion and pedestrian safety, availability and safety of parking and frequency of deliveries. And those are basically the items that we think would help us, um, you know, particularly if there were an appeal of uh, a decision of the building commissioner, try to, to figure out whether an activity, whether it's being conducted in a residential area or even in a commercial area, because this actually will um, apply to commercial areas as well, 
um, you know, has altered or impaired the character of a neighborhood. Um, if I might just uh, add to that, Robin just covered um, the real intent of the bylaw and then the, the primary amendment um, in that section B. The version that we're screen sharing right now may be the original version and not that um, that was recommended by the planning board. So um, I don't know if you think it's worth it to go through uh, some of the, the updated version. Um, yeah, so, Emily, yeah. what I just want to make sure. So the proposal is, am I correct, to delete Article uh, 3J1A? Is that um, what it, it says? It, and it, reformatting Section 3J1B as Section 3J1A? That's That's been, that was the original Warren article as proposed by the zoning board through the public hearing process with the planning board. Um, there were suggested edits and there was consensus between the two boards on what those, what form those would take. Um, so there is a revised version of this. I'm happy to screen share if- That, uh, that would be helpful. Helpful. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I apologize. This I have obviously way too many windows open. Can you see my um, whole screen? I, we ah. did, but before before continuing, Robin, do you have a um, quorum of the ZBA on this call? I think it's just me, Joe. I thought I saw um, someone else. Um, just want to make sure. I, I can no longer see everybody because of the screen share. So um, I, I did not see another ZBA member, Joe. Oh, okay. I, I don't think okay. so. I think it's just me. There's okay, no. great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so this is the slightly modified version um, that was unanimously approved um, you know, for a favorable re recommendation at town meeting by the planning board. Um, so it's not, now there is just a small change to section 3J1 um, as opposed to 1A um, and reorganization. We're adding the clause and clearly secondary um, to the statement that, uh, you know, right after or following um, accessory uses shall be those uses that are customarily incidental. And now it will read and clearly secondary. This like the original Warren article is really just a reorganization that language um, currently was in the next section of um, 3J, which it will be amended by um, item two. So uh, that would be replaced in its entirety, um, essentially by the, you know, the language that was reviewed in that first Warren article. The one change is that you know, while the zoning board um, was reacting um, when it proposed this particular amendment to um, residential accessory uses and how they may impact a neighborhood, um, they didn't, you know, directly intend to limit, um, you know, these parameters only to residential accessory uses. So you'll see the introduction to that um, states that it's additional requirements now for all accessory uses. So there were just some minor modifications through the process. Okay. Robin, are you, do you have anything further? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I don't have anything further. Okay. Um, Joe, it, it's it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty straightforward um, article really to just to kind of clean up some of the language in the bylaw, make it a little bit yeah. clearer and easier to, to interpret and also make it easier for the building department, um, you know, to enforce in those in those situations where that may right. be necessary, which honestly is is pretty rare, but it does come up from time to time. Okay. Great. Liz, any questions? Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Emily, for bringing up this version. Um, it, I noticed that it, it looks like reference to parking has been removed. Is that intentional or? So I don't know that there was a reference to 
parking in prior versions. I'm just kind of flipping through the different iterations um, of this particular article. Um, I do believe that subsection five, um, traffic congestion and pedestrian safety frequency of deliveries would get to um, you know, parking if there, if there was spillover from a particular accessory use um, so that cars were parking on an adjacent public way. That's something that the building commissioner, zoning enforcement officer and the zoning board um, could consider. Okay. Um, and visual impacts, is that things like equipment or signage or what, what does that entail? Yeah, that's exactly right, Liz. Um, you know, equipment or in one instance, we had um, a homeowner who was uh, running sort of a um, gym or athletic classes outside and had a rock wall and other sort of more commercial, you know, gym like equipment on the property that was you know, potentially an eyesore and other neighbors weren't really interested in looking at. Um, so it's, it's a, I guess it's a little bit vague, but it's, that's what it's intended to address. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go Ramsey. Yeah. First of all, uh, Robin just wanted to thank you for your leadership of the ZBA. You know, you've been the chair for several years and um, you do a great job for, for the town in that position. And, wanted to recognize that. So thank you for, for what you do for us on the ZBA. Um, Bill, she, Bill, she had a hard act to follow. You, you know, I was going to say that. She, <laughs> did. Bill, she did. Very, and, very. Uh, you've done great work for us. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Great article here. Uh, you know, I know that, you know, um, you know, during COVID, there were some issues with, you know, defining what constitutes an impact to the character of the neighborhood. So I really applaud the ZBA for bringing this forward. And I think laying out how the character is changed by these factors is important, um, particularly with um, traffic congestion and noise um, for some of the some of the different activities. I think that might go on uh, in the accessory um, dwelling. So I think this is a great article, and I appreciate the ZBA and the planning board uh, working on this and bringing this forward. And uh, I, I fully support uh, Bill's and, uh, and Liz's comments. Um, this is, uh, it, it's, it's very useful, I think, to have this sort of clarification. Um, and, uh, and you only get this experience as you go through, you know, each application, you see where there's tweaks that will help, uh, help the next case uh, come out uh, in, a, in a clear fashion. So this is, this is exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, I just had a question as to, um, I understand the ZBA was unanimous on this. Was the planning board unanimous as well? Yes. Yeah, they just voted on February 28th and as Robin confirmed, it was unanimous. Yes, great. Um, are there uh, any members of the public with comments or questions? This is on uh, Article BBB for the town, uh, the zoning bylaw. This is not something, uh, this is not an article that's being put forth by the um, select board. So we would not typically vote on this. However, because there have been um, changes, however minor to the warrant article, um, Tom, I would recommend that we actually vote to open the warrant uh, and to to insert the revised BBB, is that? Yeah, out of an abundance of caution, Joe, I completely agree with you. Okay. So I would second that motion. Well, so I would. Uh, okay. I'll make the motion <laughs> uh, that uh, we uh, we open the warrant um, and uh, insert uh, the revised Article BBB in place of the prior version of the Article BBB and then close the warrant. Second. Roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe. Aye. Great. Um, Robin, Emily, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right. So the next item on our agenda is not scheduled till until 7 p.m. So what I'd like to do, um, Tom, with your indulgence, is to move to the COVID-19 update so we can get that handled if, if you are prepared to move forward with that. I am, yep. Okay, can you hear me? You can. Yes. So for the COVID-19 update for today, um, March 8th, is that the Department of Public Health is reporting that the seven-day statewide average of confirmed COVID-19 cases has declined substantially, again, from 839 on February 27th to 648 on March 6th. And again, that's statewide. Hospitalizations statewide have fallen from 445 on February 25th to 319 on March 4th. That's all good news. Uh, the latest data in Hingham uh, shows that the case count has been declining. The DPH has reported a 14-day daily incidence rate of 27 cases in Hingham through February 24th. And on March 3rd, the DPH reported a 14-day daily incidence rate of 17. So uh, 17 down from 27 over the course of a week. Uh, it is important to note, however, that many residents are now taking home-based testing, which is most often not reported and therefore not in these statistics. And as a result, we are assuming that the actual number of positive cases is higher than these statistics show. Uh, regarding COVID-19 test kit distribution, uh, the town has received some 8,000 or so rapid antigen test kits from Plymouth County. Um, and then we did in fact conduct uh, two fairly successful distribution days for Hingham residents earlier, uh, earlier in the year. And uh, we are now making a, additional test kits available for pickup. Uh, and those will be available at the following locations. Uh, the Hingham Police Station, that's at 212 Central Street. The Hingham Fire Station, so Central Fire at 339 Main Street. Uh, the Hingham Rec Recreation Office, which is here at Hingham Town Hall. Uh, as well as the Hingham Health Department, and uh, that's all at 210 Central Street. The Hingham Farmers Market will also have them at 204 Union Street uh, at the Wampatuck State Park Visitor Center, and then the, um, uh, the Senior Center will also make them available at 224 Central Street. So again, police station, fire station, rec, town hall, and health offices, the Farmers Market, and the Senior Center will all have um, test kits available for, for pickup free of charge to the, all, all Hingham residents. Um, regarding the pediatric vaccination clinic, the Hingham Public Schools did hold a vaccination clinic, um, a pediatric vaccination clinic on March 5th, uh, and they administered 26 vaccinations to Hingham residents. Uh, regarding a masking policy, so on March 4th, I announced my lifting of the masking policy um, which was effective, made effective on Monday, March 7th, 2022. So this past Monday, yesterday, uh, which reverses a policy that I instituted on September 7th, 2021. The decision to lift the policy was made based on the reduction of the number of reported COVID-19 cases in Hingham. Uh, high vaccination rates among uh, Hingham residents as well as statewide hospitalization trends. On February 28th, the Hingham Public Schools implemented a mask optional policy in its buildings and on its buses. And on March 3rd, the Hingham Board of Health lifted its mask advisory. So taken together, these decisions leave masking an individual's option in all town-owned buildings. Regarding a COVID command group, I just wanted to report that uh, effective today, this group led by the Fire Chief Steve Murphy has decided to shift to bi-weekly meetings. We've been we meeting weekly and more often as needed since the pandemic began. Um, this group will continue to monitor the COVID-19 situation and coordinate town actions as needed. I will be reducing the frequency of these COVID-19 reports as well. And of course, as any new news occurs, we will report those as appropriate. Chief Murphy is in fact also organizing input from town departments to assemble a townwide after action review. Uh, this project will capture lessons learned to strengthen town operations and resilience in the future. Um, and that'll be an interesting re uh, review and report that we get on our, uh, like I said, an after action report for our response to the pandemic. 
uh, regarding public health protocols. Uh, please continue to take precautions to protect yourself and others from COVID-19. As we all know, vaccination, wearing face coverings, practicing social distancing, and frequently washing hands, among other measures, will help protect us all from COVID-19. On January 7th, 2022, the Hingham Board of Health did issue a, revi a, a, a health advisory recommending this use, and that policy has since been lifted. The Hingham, uh, the health advisory is directed to all visitors and employees, uh, or was directed to all visitors, employees in town. Uh, the CDC and the Mass DPH are, um, do have a guidance on face coverings, and those guidances can be found on their respective websites. They are changing rapidly, so uh, be aware uh, of that. And then um, the Board of Health is still recommending that to the extent you use masks, uh, that you use an N95 or KN95 mask as woven cloth masks and gaiters provide less protection. Um, and that is all, Joe. Thank you. Liz, any questions? No questions. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Bill? No questions. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Um, so I would just add uh, two comments. Uh, first, uh, if you recall, I think there was uh, last month or the month before, you could order your free at-home COVID-19 tests from the government. Uh, they announced this week that you can place another order. So if you didn't order or you did order, you can order again uh, to get your free at-home tests and you can order it at covidtests.gov. Um, and the second point, just to um, follow up on Tom's comment about the uh, CDC guidance, uh, there is still CDC guidance with respect to travel, uh, traveling uh, internationally especially. So again, you should uh, make sure you consult with the CDC guidance uh, for their health notices. Any member of the public with comments or questions on the COVID-19 report? Seeing none, I am not sure that we can take up any other item on our agenda uh, prior to 7 p.m. So I would recommend we can actually take a uh, 20 minute break and reconvene at seven, unless uh, Tom or any member of the select board thinks that uh, there's something else that we can, we can discuss prior to that. I think okay. that's a... So uh, Michelle, would you, if you know, just put up a little note that we'll uh, reconvene at seven, I will declare a recess now until 7 p.m. Good evening, the time is 7 p.m. The select board is now out of recess. And at this point, I'd like to call on uh, our friends at the school committee to uh, call their meeting to order. Thanks, Joe. Um, I will call the uh, March 8th meeting of the Hingham School Committee to order at 7 p.m. And next, I will turn to the advisory committee to call their meeting to order. Bully, we can't hear you. Thanks, Joe. I'd like to call the advisory committee meeting to order on March 8th at 7 p.m. The advisory committee meeting, uh, sorry, the advisory committee members in attendance so far, we have Brenda Black, Tina Sherwood, Kristen Dagowski. We have Bob Curley, Javeline Cooper, George Danis, Nancy McDonald. And that's all I got so far. Okay. And Carrie, I should have asked you if uh, you wanted to identify members of the school committee who are present for your meeting. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Carrie Nee, uh, chair of the school committee. I'm participating remotely along with my colleagues, Michelle Ayer. Um, Jen Benham will be joining us. Ness Carenti, mm -hmm. Carlos De Silva, I believe is on. Um, Tim Dempsey will not be uh, attending tonight and Liza O'Reilly. And now I will turn to the Capital Outlay Committee to call their meeting to order. Well, I'm not sure if Eric has signed on yet. I shot him a quick text message. Ah. Um, well, I will wait. This is intended to be a joint meeting, so I will wait a minute or two before proceeding. We have other members of Capital Atlee uh, 
in attendance? Oh. Um, I'm here as an ADCOM member of Capital Outlay. I don't actually see, I don't see Matt here. Um, I don't actually see any of the other members. Oh, Mike, I think. So I think there are only two of us here thus far. Michelle, do you know, was this a, a notice meeting for Capital Outlay? Yes, it was, and he said he will join shortly. Okay. Good evening. Hello. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Sorry, um, uh, it's late here. So, um, any member, any any members, other members of Capital Outlay? Michelle, I believe that that's Eric. You have three, right? Uh, yes, we, uh, it looks like we have Mike Donovan on the line and see, Dave Williams here too. Yeah, Mike's here. Sorry, I was unable to unmute earlier. Apologize. So, Eric, you realize as the last to join uh, committee, uh, you're responsible for providing hors d'oeuvres for everyone here. Okay. As long so, as it's not the minute. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll expect the treat shortly. Um, but if you can uh, just call your meeting to order and identify uh, the members present, please. Uh, sure. Uh, so at 704, we'll call the Capital Outlay meeting to order. And uh, Mike Donovan and David Lane Cooper are present. Great. Thank you. So uh, with that, uh, we are going to turn to the fiscal year 2023 financial forecast update. And uh, it will be Tom and Michelle to give us the initial presentation. Great, thank you, Joe. I'll turn this over to Michelle in a moment. Um, just wanted to kick it off. This is our final forecast. So we've been doing forecast updates, you've all heard throughout the season. Um, those forecasts uh, are updated on occasion as new information comes in. Uh, this is our final forecast, which traditionally includes um, a path from uh, me and my office towards a, um, that can be followed towards a balanced budget. So what you'll see when you see this forecast is a balanced budget, a zero uh, in the deficit column. Uh, so with that, uh, with that said, and oh, and I'll also mention that um, what we've done to get to that balanced budget is to withdraw or with um, remove all additional requests from uh, town and school for additional additional requests, and those um, can be. Uh, considered by uh, the select board and ADCOM um, as as we move forward through this process over the next week or two. So, uh, but this is a balanced budget presentation that you're going to hear from Michelle. Michelle. Thank you, Tom. So I will bring up the forecast document briefly here. But I find we've found that it's often more helpful to talk about a slide that kind of walks through the changes so that people can follow us. But as Tom mentioned, the, the bottom line here is showing a zero, which means that we've balanced up by 23. This is one path forward. I'm happy to come back to this document and its subsequent pages, but Sue and I can quickly show this slide that summarizes the changes first. Or not slide, but another spreadsheet. So we had the forecast group met a few weeks ago and, and talked about an interim, interim forecast that had contemplated using this, the balance of the stabilization fund. The first two line items here that you see in comparison the previous forecast with the forecast that we discussed yesterday as a group um, talk about reversing the stabilization fund use. So the Department of Revenue came out with some guidance late in February that basically clarified for us um, that we weren't able to use the stabilization fund the way we were hoping to in FY23. The Sustainable Budget Task Force had recommended looking into the stabilization fund to see if we could accelerate that use 
in FY23 to help bridge the budget gap. So we were hoping to use the $2.1 million balance here. Um, but with this new guidance from DLS, we'd need to revert back to our old practice of using about 178,000 each year to reduce the interest related to certain debt excluded projects. Um, so unfortunately this change widens the hole um, back by $2.1 million. The other news that we got yesterday afternoon from Plymouth County in, when talking about the sources is that Plymouth County is going to release, um, they're gonna make available $10 million to member communities to use for revenue replacement. And they said that Hingham could count on $473,502 from the county for this purpose so that we can put that towards the FY23 budget. So that helps close the gap by that amount. They did say that if other communities don't seek to use their funds for this purpose, there could potentially be more available to the town, um, but they won't know that number before our town meeting in April. But at a minimum, we can count on the 473 to help us close the gap in FY23. Farther down below, we'll walk through all the different funds that are currently in this federal fund slash fund balance line. There's different pots of ARPA and ESSER and other funds in there. So we'll explain that. On the uses side in this forecast, we also talked last time about um, potentially using some non-excluded debt capacity to fund capital outlay. There was about $249,000 potentially in that line um, but when we looked closer at the bands, the, the bond anticipation notes that we have rolling over this spring, that capacity is gonna be used up with debt service. So that money is, won't be available for capital outlay on top of the capital outlay allocation of 2.7 million. So we just reverse that, um, that transaction here. That doesn't change the gap at all. It's simply moving one use from another use um, down below in article six. Um, the other two changes that we made before we talk about the balanced budget, one is related to the conservation department. A few weeks ago, our board discussed a reserve fund transfer for FY22 to fund Hingham's share of the Straits Pond um, allocation for certain repairs to the tidal gate over there and some studies. Straits Pond um, monies are split between Hull, Hingham, Cohasset. Hull takes the lead on this account and they pay 50% of the expenditures but Hingham and Cohasset each contribute 25%. For the FY23 contribution, we needed to add 22,000 to the conservation department budget. This is something that the three conservation officers are gonna to work together in, 24, in FY24 and forward to find grant funds to help pay for these costs. Typically in, an, in a given year, the operating expenses are only between three and 5,000, but there's some larger repairs and some studies that are making this number go up for a short amount of time. And then the last number that changed, this was something we had been waiting for. The GIC for health insurance voted the new FY23 rates um, last Thursday, I believe. So Sue did some number crunching there based on everyone who's currently on the town's health insurance um, and made some assumptions about where they might be in going into the next year. So we were able to reduce that request by 48,000. All of those changes still left us with a deficit of about 3.2 million. And then if I scroll down a little bit, what we did is, is what Tom said. We, re, we took out all of the additional requests for the school and municipal departments, which lowered the number by about 1.7 million. And then we filled the remaining gap of about 1.5 million with unassigned fund balance. And this little table below here walks through the different pieces that are in that federal funds slash fund balance line. So the first is about 1.4 million in ARPA. This is the second tranche of the direct allocation that Hingham is getting from the state slash federal government. We got the first 1.2 million last June and used that to help plug the gap in FY22. And the second tranche we expected this June and we can use that to help FY23. Um, as I mentioned before, Plymouth County let us know yesterday that there's another 473,000 available through the county for the town to use. And then talking with John Ferris, he let us know that there might be $400,000 in ESSER funds not used in FY22 that we could apply to the FY23 budget. And finally, there's the 1.5 million in fund balance um, that we propose using to plug the FY23 gap. And this totals to 3.7 million in federal funds and fund balance in that line. Uh, 
I can I can go back to the forecast, but are there any questions about these various changes? Want to go back to the forecast, Michelle? Yeah. I could go down to the Article 6 detail. Joe, I think that's the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions. OK, um, I will uh, first ask Liz Klein for questions, then Bill, then I'll turn it over to um, ADCOM, uh, then the school committee, uh, and then to uh, Capitale. So I will start with, uh, with Liz. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So when we're looking, um, we just had all the, um, the, sal the wages and salaries. I can go back. Um, so that obviously, that's no additional requests for personnel. That's based on the wage and classification and, and the CBA agreements, right? That's right. Okay. Um, okay, and then I know we were waiting on the health insurance number and that's obviously updated. Um, do you have any sense of if we'll get any additional monies from Plymouth? It seems hard to believe that other people aren't gonna ask for their share. <laughs> When I spoke to Tom O'Brien, the, the treasurer over there, he thought that that was a likely possibility that they would, that some towns may not use it for this purpose and it would be redistributed, but he couldn't say in what amount and he said he would not have the information next month. Okay. Um, so to the extent that there is more available to the town, we could apply that to the budget and it just wouldn't come out of unassigned fund balance if that's the route that we choose to go. Um, but at least with certainty, we can plug the $473,000 number in now. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't have any other questions right this second. Um, so before turning it over, before turning it to Bill, I just want to make sure to follow up on Liz's question uh, that the wage reclassification work is all reflected in the fiscal year 2023 numbers. Is that correct, Michelle? That's right. The wage reclassification and any collective bargaining agreements right. that have been settled. Okay, thanks. Bill. I was going to ask you about the 473 from Plymouth County, but you said we won't know for another month or so, um, Michelle. The 473 is definite according to their treasurer, but anything yeah. beyond that, they won't know for a few months. Okay. Uh, my, my second question to you is um, the restrictions on the use of the stabilization fund money. Um, are those going to carry over into FY24? So yes, because what DLS published basically had three different tiers of bond. It was all about bond premiums from excluded debt projects. And it depended if you did it before 20, a certain time in 2016, between 2016 and December of 2021, and then December of 21 going forward. But the two projects, Sue was able, was able to help us track back what monies are actually in the stabilization fund now. And they were both bond premiums from excluded issuances we did in 2016 and before. So that use, unless DLS updates its, its guidance, won't change. Okay, thank you. Uh, and if I can just follow up on that one as well. So when we initially made the assessment of using the stabilization funds, we did look at the statute. We did um, our own legal analysis. And my understanding is that we believed that it could proceed. The guidance that came through um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to be grounded in the statute, but uh, it's, that's not a battle that we're looking to, to wage. Uh, so we are accepting the guidance and proceeding uh, as if um, we cannot use those funds. Is that, is that a fair summary, Michelle? Yes, so the stabilization fund can be used for any lawful purpose, but because we got more clarity on the source of the funds that went into it, when we checked with bond council about this new guidance, he advised that we should, we should um, we should make sure that we're, yes, applying that yep. appropriately. Okay, great. Um, so Julie, I will turn to ADCOM first. 
Thanks, Joe. And I'd like to note that the advisory committee adopts the remote meeting open meeting law language read by you at the beginning of the meeting. Yep. And I would just ask Michelle if you could scroll down to the bottom of this, the first page. First page. Yeah. So we can just see that in the um, first year out in FY24, the excess is $5.8 million. And then yes. I just want to highlight the use of fund balance and federal funds at the $3.7 million. And that's combined federal aid and unassigned fund balance, correct? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Bob? There we go. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I, uh, my question relates to a couple of letters to the ADCOM I saw this afternoon <clears throat> that mentioned um, the discovery of $1.7 million in unspent education funds. And I am pretty much totally in the dark about that, but uh, it, it prompts my question of, uh, do we anticipate that those funds will be will remain unspent by the end of FY22? And are they available for a budget use with respect to FY23? Or are they, are they going to fund balance at the end of uh, FY22? And, and therefore are kind of an offset to the fund balance we're gonna use. So I, I don't know who's best to answer that question or if anybody has an answer, but I'd be very interested. I can speak to that a little and then maybe turn it over to John. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so we did discuss this. It's a preliminary um, for a, a prediction right now, um, and it's, we're not at a point where we can say for sure how much is going to be left over. Um, John made some recommendations last night about um, putting some of the special education stabilization um, funds to, uh, to to make sure that we're protected if we have move-ins or, or sudden uh, changes in placement for um, children who are, have out of district placements. Um, and it's the committee discussed it, and we also discussed um, potentially putting it towards some of the, the budget proposals for this year, um, such as the special education um, vans. But we, um, the, the direction was to the administration to take a look and see um, it, how to how to best use that money. Um, John, do you want to maybe elaborate a little more? Um, yeah, sure. So, Bob, so. The, the forecast, it's a, it's a forecast, it's preliminary, it's very, you know, forecasting is very humbling, you never know, you know, where the number might come up. Um, the drivers, <clears throat> there's some, so there's some known drivers that have to do with, um, you know, uh, movement or, or favorable uh, hiring um, in, in the budget. There's a, a little bit of a driver that has to do with um, uh, the, the, the need to utilize some federal grants um, and, you know, so, and, and let me say, you know, with the federal grants, especially um, <clears throat> with the, the rules and regulations surrounding them, you have to be very careful because we can't supplant the basic operating budget from the grants, but we had a IDA grant of a couple hundred thousand dollars that we have to use. So, you know, we, we've uh, planned to use that. Um, and then the, uh, you know, we, we do know that we've had some special education um, students age out. The age outs that are reflected in the 23 budget actually commenced in 22. So, so we know that we have, uh, you know, some form of money and the 1.7, as I said, is a, it's a preliminary number. Um, you know, it could go up or down by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, I could have made a mistake. I mean, the numbers seem like they're very, very big. Um, but what I do know is that we do have some, so I've actually recommended to the committee that we um, fund the special ed reserve um, to the tune of $350,000, which would bring that balance up to 750. So if we had a um, problem with tuitions in this 23 budget, since it's uh, 
you know, sharply reduced that, you know, they'd have some fallback there. And, um, you know, previously to that, previous to this, I've actually told the town about a $400,000 worth of, um, of uh, ESSER. So, you know, at this point, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're at a $700,000 level at this time, you know, is, could that money be used for capital projects or for other, other uh, opportunities in the school budget? That's gonna be a decision of the school committee. So I guess, I guess so whether so whether that whether some part of that um, money will be available for for operating budget use in FY twenty three, um, when will we have some idea about that? And I think it has to be. I mean, it has to be discussed. You know, the committee has to like the the committee got this firsthand yesterday. So I think that. Um, you know, they had a number of ideas. We discussed a number of ideas. So, um, you know, I think that we need some time to digest, you know, what we're actually going to, um, you know, do with the money, um, you know, and, and a lot will that be dependent upon, you know, what we, what we see is, uh, you know, the budget that we'll obtain for 23. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a discussion that we're going to have to have, and we probably will commence those next week in finance. Okay, thank you. I see Liz Klein has her hand raised. We can go back to Liz. Okay, thank you, Julie. Just a, just a question about the 1.7 million. Do we know how many FTEs that represents, or are those positions that we weren't haven't been able to fill yet? Oh no, they're all filled. I mean, those they, those are the 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 positions that we hired have been filled. Some have been, you know, but um, and we've had, you know, they've been delayed. We've had some delays. We've had some um, hired and then failed, you know, or hired and, and and left and stuff. A couple. I mean, you know, I mean, if there's if there's like five hundred thousand dollars roughly worth of like hiring variances or movement variances. You know, maybe half of it has to do with a, a, those couple of, uh, of jobs and the other half has to do with really a favorable pricing environment where, you know, we took in a lot of younger um, teachers at uh, more favorable rates than were reflected in the budget. So, um, you know, at this point, all the FTEs that are reflected in the 22 budget are also reflected in the 23 budget. And, okay, and so, to my knowledge, they're still they're still necessary. They're still needed. They're still part of the program that, you know, will will be implemented to the extent. If we didn't have any resource, uh, you know, at this point, if they would be um, the services would be provided by a contract, or the services that are necessary. So, I don't think kids are not going underserved. They're they're getting all the services that uh, that they need, you know, whether it be by through the teacher that's in place or um, or contract services. Okay, okay, thank you, Andy. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, John. I hate to appear to be picking on you, but um, uh, the those. Why doesn't the money uh, go into um, uh, fund balance, any unspent <clears throat> funds? And and do you have, do you being the school committee, do you have authority to create a reserve account and, and fund it the way you propose to put some of this money in the, uh, uh, what you call the special ed reserve? Yeah, so um, Andy, so the special ed reserve was created by, in 2014, and then it, uh, subsequently modified in 2015, where we made an application for special legislation in order to, you know, uh, protect ourselves. Because prior to that, we had some, um, you know, significant increases during the budget process. I mean, to the tune of five, six hundred thousand dollars from January through April, where our budget number had to go up by that amount. So after that year passed, we did form a special committee that um, took a look at the situation and, and made recommendation for Hingham to file for really a self-rule that would um, allow us to, 
create a special education reserve account from funds that may be available from the school operating budget at, during any end of the year period, you know, not to exceed 2%. And the idea of those funds is they would be used for unanticipated tuitions and transportation for special education services that may pop up, you know, during the school year or, you know, after that budget happens. So we had no insight of it, but all of a sudden we had a move in, we were responsible for some tuitions or, um, you know, subsequent to a, to us floating, um, telling what our number was in January. And all of a sudden we had a new um, a residential come in to the tune of $300,000 or so. We wouldn't necessarily have to increase our budget request at that moment. We would have this fund to fall back on. So it's not anything I'm creating now. It's been long created back in 2015, 14, 15. Um, so, so that's a special ed reserve. Uh, and as far as, you know, why the money doesn't fall back, the money, the money, th that's really going to be a decision of the school committee. It's, it's not my authority to say where the money goes. It has to, the, the money's been appropriated to the school committee. So it's really up to uh, them to come to the you know, conclusions of how they want to deploy this money um, or give it back. And as I said last night, it's the first time they heard about the, uh, of these dollars as well. So I think, um, you know, we all need sort of time to digest it and figure out what a plan going forward might be. Um, the, uh, uh, okay. And when you say the, uh, the reserve cannot exceed 2%, is that 2%? Did you say the reserve or the transfer into the reserve? cannot exceed 2%, is it 2% of the total education budget? Yeah, that's the total balance that the reserve can go up to, Andy, I believe. I mean, I'd have to refresh myself on the warrant, but I believe that, so if we have a $60 million budget, that reserve could get as high as 1.2. I mean, I, I don't think we need to put 1.2 in it, but I think 750, especially in light of, you know, when you look at our responsible 23 budget of 1.43%, of a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, $1.3 million drop in tuitions. That's luck, right? That has nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with school performance or us being, I mean, it's somewhat, you know, we do to do what we can to maintain the children in house, make them more inclusive and, and make the best programs. But, you know, by and large, when you see significant drops like that, it turns out to be luck. And in, in these couple of years, you have the age outs. Um, you know, I've been here for 11 years. I might have seen one or two age outs. And then all of a sudden I see five age outs. Uh, you know, but that's because I'm getting older too. So we're all sort of aging out of everything, you know, when it comes down to it. And it's luck. But, you know, luck turns on a dime and all of a sudden you're, you're back into the swing of things. And this, this amount of money, the 750, that's a couple of um, residential tuitions. It's, it's not an extraordinary amount of money. The uh, one last question. Uh, the fund balance memo indicates that uh, <clears throat> for fiscal 20, for example, there was uh, an encumbrance of $117,000 uh, not expended. What? I, I didn't quite understand what the encumbrance meant. Uh, the, John, you, you want me to answer that? Yeah, if you would, Sue, that'd be great. Thank you. Basically, Andy, it is uh, the school's PO system. If they don't use it, uh, the complete PO that has been encumbered, it would fall to fund balance. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, wait a minute. Let me go. Sorry. Their their uh, purchase order system. You encumber. They, they, they encumber all their unused POs at June yep. 30th. If all that all their unused uh, account purchase orders. Payable. Yep. 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 And if they and, don't use it all, then it falls to fund balance. Okay. And likewise, the surplus of a million something in fiscal 21. Did that just go into fund balance? From where? Yeah, I, I would think it, yeah, I think it, it, yes. um, it, it did, absolutely. 
But let's but get, like, I hope every everybody needs to keep in mind that fiscal 21 was because we got $2.7 million worth of CARES reimbursement. Okay. Right. So, so w w what we did was we used the government money as opposed to the taxpayers' money, which to my dying day as a Hingham resident, I will say that is the correct thing to do. And I'm happy it went into fund balance. And, and uh, yeah, you had a 1.3 in receivables from the Plymouth County CARES Act uh, uh, noted in the funds balance memo. And, and, and that, I guess, uh, gave you a 1.1 surplus that went into funds balance. Yeah, a lot, right. of, the spending was, a lot yeah. of the spending was different last year, Andy. That's correct, yeah. The, the, yeah. the spending, and, and much of it because of the way we operated, we were doing things biz differently because of COVID. So, you know, and, and all of that qualified for government money. So in, in some sense, we were using the government money because we were doing things differently. And as a result, our normal operations didn't get spent accordingly. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so, so it's really... You know, I know forever and infamy a year of all we gave this much money back is going to be pointed at the school department is not spending their budgets. But, you know, you don't want to just waste the money. You want to do the right thing with the money. Yep. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. I guess the the moral of the story in, in my mind might be that maybe Adcom should next time we, we look at the financial policy, consider whether some portion at least of uh, surplus operating funds uh, should be uh, set aside for uh, operating budgets for the following years. Just uh, a thought, Sue, Sue, don't don't make those faces at me. I'm just, you know. <laughs> I've got a lot of ideas on that, Andy, but we've, we've discussed them, you know, but a lot of it's uh, regulated. It's, it's government accounting. A lot of it is just not a lot of flexibility sometimes. She makes the same faces as you. <laughs> all set, Andy? Thanks. Uh, so I just want to note that the advisory committee education subcommittee is having a meeting tomorrow night as well to, um, to dig into any last questions about the education budget request. But of course, Kristen, you can go next. Hi, just following up again with um, Andy and what Bob said. So if you're saying that you could use that money towards special education, possibly for FY23 in case for, you know, people aged out, but that could come back next year. Um, so are you saying that you can use that for FY23 budget? No, there's a, there's a special reserve, Kristen. Okay. It's called the special ed, ed uh, okay. reserve account. It sits in fund balance, but it's, 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 um, it's, it's, act, it's, is it unsigned fund balance or is it access? No, it's, is it it's, in a special, fund it, it's a special fund trust yeah, that okay. we set up according to um, the, the special, special legislature that the town meeting voted to go through. Okay. So the school committee can, before June 30th, if they're going to have a surplus, they can take some of that money and put it into the special uh, ed trust. Okay. Okay. And it is only to be used for special ed trust emergencies. Okay, just clarifying that it can't be used for an FY23 budget item. No, it no. cannot. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Dave? Uh, hi, and, and Michelle, could I trouble you to throw the um, forecast back up for just one quick second? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. While she's doing that, let me make my daily plea for people to read the Sustainable Budget Task Force report. For those who haven't and anybody who's on the call tonight, um, it's a wonderful piece of work. And I think it frames some really important issues that we're addressing tonight. And I, I, I applaud the zero in uh, FY23, but I would note that that is a necessary but insufficient condition or solution to our problem, which is laid out in 24, 5, 6, and 7. So I, I just, I didn't want that to get glossed over. And um, 
just want people to pay attention that, it, you know, when you strip out the fund balance usage and when you strip out the, and by the way, that I'll talk about this more at ACES tomorrow night, but the fund balance usage is significant, is envisioned to be significant. I know there's been discussion about the fund balance, the magnitude of the unassigned fund balance or excess fund balance. Um, I don't know if we have a slide on that and maybe it's a little bit off topic tonight, but I think uh, it's important for people to note that in addition to this fund balance allocation to propose to close the budget this year, there's additional fund balance proposed to be used to offset some future capital uh, or cost of debt related to some big capital projects that are near and dear to many people's hearts, um, as well as a couple other uses uh, that leave us without uh, much of a excess fund balance. Uh, and so I think that's to be noted, uh, lest anyone think that there's a lot of additional fund balance that's just not being applied to this current uh, challenge. So, you know, just for uh, simplicity's sake, you're looking at potentially an operating override of $5.8 million if FY24 played out just as it did, uh, and if we're not gonna make any adjustments to services. So uh, that's the context in which we're looking at the budget, or I should say, let me say it this way, that's the context in which I'm looking at the budget this year and I think when people talk about additional requests, it's important to look at not just 23, but the out years. Um, and I applaud that. And that's uh, to close where I started. That's why I recommend the Sustainable Budget Task Force, which takes a very hard look at that, takes a very hard look at other revenue options um, that may be on the horizon. And um, I really just encourage anybody who is concerned, frustrated, interested, um, about this budget to read that document as a starting point so you can uh, come at it with the best information we have available now. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. George? Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, yeah, and Michelle, I want to look at this page again, and I just want to pick up um, where Dave left off and just ask what the what the expense assumptions are for 24, which is with with, with the $5.8 million deficit, um, you know, and does that include the, um, the positions that at this point are being considered to be off the table, I guess, um, you know, the 23 requests and uh, so maybe you could just um, just frame that the expense um, assumptions in the 24 year. Sure, and Sue can correct me if I'm wrong. So because FY23 doesn't include any additional requests this year, those are also not reflected in 24 going forward. I believe we have personnel going up by 3% in FY24 and expenses maybe going up by two or two and a half. I'd have to look behind the scenes. Okay, so no, no new positions in 24 or 23. That's is, right. Is what this budget reflects. I, I mean, I know, I know we're very early in, in looking at 24, but just, you know, trying to get my head around, um, you know, the, the, the projected deficit at this point. Okay, thank you. Thanks, George. Do any other advisory committee members have any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Dave Yeah, I just wanna go back to that excess 1.7 million in the school budget. As I understand it, John um, and Carrie, between now and the end of the year, you can reallocate that money to fund other things or other needs that you have. So it may be that at the end of the year, you have no excess funds. Is that, it, it, do I understand that correctly? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thanks, Jaylene. Nancy? Thanks, Julie. Um, and thanks, Michelle, for the, all this data. I, um, I just had a question for John. I, I just, I can't get it clear in my head. Um, there there's, were a couple um, citizens that asked why you couldn't hire with that 1.7, particularly the arts director, that's top of mind, I think, for a lot of folks. Um, and why that art direct, I, I know that you can't delay it until FY23, but is there a reason that you couldn't hire them now? 
I, you know, I, I guess that the, the answer to that, Nancy, in honesty, is that there's no reason why you couldn't hire them, except for you, I wouldn't put a, a recurring charge into an operating budget that doesn't have an FTE in there. You know, I, I think that the proper way is to go forward and to request it and to get it properly approved within the budget. I mean, realistically, the, the money could be used for anything and you could end up with a school system that says, hey, we're going we're gonna to hire a dozen people right now. And then they'd be laying off people, you know, in May because they don't have the budget money. And, and I'm for, just, for, I'm for just trying year. to wrap my head around this, like I said, but I guess my, my thinking on that is what's the, what's the difference between taking it from that 1.7 that you have and based on, based on the numbers that I've seen, it would be less than 1% of that 1.7 would go to the um, hiring that arts director. In fact, it would be a lot less because it wouldn't be a full year. So, um, but what's the difference between that or waiting and taking it out of fund balance next? I mean, it, at the end of the day, we're looking at trying to use excess funds and, and if there's, they're available now, it seems to me that's... Right, it's not the 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 money is it's the money's not there for next year so you, you wouldn't but regardless it, it isn't either way is what i'm saying well it, it isn't there yet right it isn't there yet but um uh, the votes on the budget haven't come forward yet so either so the money's so, not there for next no, year. no so. but what i'm saying is even if it gets voted into the budget yeah. there we just looked at on the forecast we already have to use fund balance so that is going to come out of some fund balance is my point. It's, it's coming out of some non-recurring fund is my point till we get to FY24 and actually do an exercise to get the additional income. Right, but we each get an appropriation at town meeting. So, I mean, in each department is responsible for not spending anything beyond what their appropriation is. So if we did that, and I don't have an appropriation to fund that salary for next year, then I would I would be over budget and I can't be over budget. We can never be over budget. So yeah. so the, the you know because it's recurring, it just doesn't work. Yeah, it just I just wanted to clarify. We could do we could go and hire an arts director right now, but we'd have to lay them off in July of 2022 if we didn't have the money for it. So uh, it, that's not really a responsible way to um, to budget for the future. At 1.7, we could we could. Take, salary out of that to pay an art director between now and the next fiscal year, but then going forward, we have to fund that position too. So that's, that's the predicament we're in. The other thing too, Nancy, is like lots of time, I mean, it's, it's nice, we'll, you know, hopefully we get a, a fine art director funded within our budget for 23. And then you want to get an advertisement out really early because, you know, most people, the, 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 the good finance directors, they're already engaged, um, you know, or, you know, unless you're taking somebody new. So it's, it's not always great to, to be looking for people mid-year. You want to be sort of prepared and get ready to go at the start of the school year. Anybody else from an advisory committee have any questions? Caitlin? Thanks, Julie. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. I, I think Carrie and John answered this, but just to be crystal clear in, in my head. So when you guys were um, coming up with the forecast for FY23, that like the 1.7 million that you're favorable um, for FY22 wasn't in your baseline when you were planning your 23 numbers? Because I, I guess where I'm getting stuck in my head is if, if that was part of your baseline and it's favorable this year and i apologize john i know you went through some of the reasons why it was favorable but i i didn't have a chance to write it down um is that embedded in your those same kind of um, activities embedded in your 23 assumptions as well i'm just trying to make sure i understand the question because the 23 is the is is a buildup of a, of a budget it includes all of the people that are currently, um, you know, in the budget. It includes those, the, the the favorable hiring. It includes the, 
uh, teachers that may have come and um, and and left, you know, regarding FTEs. Uh, it includes a schedule of tuitions that reflect what we believe tuitions to be, the known tuitions that we know for next year, and the, and transportation. So, so basically, it the 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 one point seven attrition, you would say, or or the one point seven. It's 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 already sort of in that budget. Maybe that's why you know another another one of the another one of the factors why the budget's sitting at 1.43 now too because you know the the cost structure overall has like you know declined, so it's 1.43. So basically, it's okay. all everything that's in 22 is in 23, and it's priced accordingly based on what we believe the price is to be and what we know the price is to be based on contract. Okay, and that, that is my, that yeah, it definitely does. It's yeah, because you did a bottom bottoms up budget, essentially not like taking last year and trending it for some of these buckets that so the favorability you're seeing this year isn't isn't right. there next year. Okay, got yeah, it. Thank none, you for clarifying that. Is, none of our budgeting is like last year, just that spread to it. We don't do that. I don't do that at all. Okay. We, we have a lot of detail, a lot of backup sheets. Um, you know, we try to look at every single account. Um, the accounts that we don't, I mean, we even sort of try to schedule out what our uh, supplies are for, you know, schools and, and the equipment that they actually need. What I, what I don't, when I don't have a number for something, we would use inflation and that would happen on a very small amount of the budget. Um, you know, so basic supplies like pins, pencils and stuff, they're not expected to, to itemize those out. So we'd, uh, we'd use, you know, the inflation factor this year, which is, when I did the budget uh, back in this October, I used the price deflator index, and that was, I think, at 4.7 percent then. Um, and then, you know, so, but that's that's on a very small amount of the budget. Like that, we're lucky if that's on a million dollars of the budget. Um, everything else is attempted to be scheduled out from from the bottom up. Great, thank you. And, that clarified and, it. Energy, energy is always a wild card too. Energy would be based on usage and whatever the current price is at the current time or one that we may anticipate. And I mean, I can tell you right now, 23, hopefully that's going to get better because we're way above any anticipated rate for 23. Great. Thank you so much. Anybody else from the advisory committee? Okay, Joe, we're all set. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, could you put up the five-year forecast uh, slide again? Yep. And, and I am going to turn the meeting now over to the school committee, Carrie Nee, and just, uh, if you could just scroll up to the top, Michelle. So, cause this, the agenda item here is our five-year preliminary forecast. And so uh, refocusing on that, just asking uh, the school committee if they have questions or comments on, on the, uh, the forecast. Turning this over to uh, to Kerry. Thank you, Joe. Um, do, if anyone on the school committee has any questions or comments, could you just use the raise hand function? Liza? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I would like to add to this discussion about this $1.7 million that last night was the first time that we saw it as well and also last night was the first time we saw this preliminary forecast that our additional asks were taken out of the budget so we have as a school committee we have a lot to think about and we've heard from many constituents that they want us to use the funds that the town has given for the schools. I personally would like to work collaboratively with the advisory committee and the select board on identifying how best we can use um, whatever, if we can move ESSER funds into fiscal year 23 or you, or if we're looking at a fund balance return, can that be applied to the asks that we had for our budget? Because we were below 2% in our request. We were very prudent. 
these were really critical items. And so, um, you know, I was as surprised to see this forecast as all of you were surprised to hear about a $1.7 million of potential available funds from the school department budget. And I think we can all work together to do what's best for the town and for our students and our families. Um, so, you know, I just I wanted to add that to all of you. And I, I guess I also want to would like to know what's the target date of finalizing this for town meeting? Because, you know, I also recognize we're down to crunch time and we got to make some fast decisions. So um, I guess I is advisory voting on Thursday night. It's on our agenda to vote on Thursday. It's a possibility. And then we have some cushion for early next week because we have an, other articles to take up early next week as well, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and, you know, hopefully we can have a good discussion tomorrow night with the ACES group. You know, Nancy, thank you for <laughs> speaking up on behalf of trying to get things done that um, the schools have been asking for and that a lot of families want. Um, tonight, there's the All Town Band concert. Um, you know, prime audience of people that have really been asking for this fine arts director. Um, so the school committee has a lot of work to do very quickly. And on behalf of the whole town, I recognize that if there's available funds that potentially can benefit everyone, and we're all in a crunch. Um, I also recognize that looking at the the uh, years going out, um, it's a big number, but that's something we've been talking about for a long time. And as Dave said, yes, please read the Sustainable Budget Task Force, because that's the reason that that group was put together. And we should all anticipate an override to accommodate requests for the town and for the schools that people want and you know, expect for keeping services to the levels uh, that our citizens want. So thank you for allowing me to comment. But um, and, and I'm committed to working as fast as possible to determining how to use the funds appropriately. Thank you, Liza. Ness? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation and the update on the forecast. Um, I just wanted to go back to something David Anderson had talked about. He had brought up he brought up the um, unassigned fund balance. And I just wanted to remind everybody who's on the call what that means. I think sometimes we are in these meetings and we the the people who are not here every time don't necessarily know what we're talking about. Um, so it's the financial policy of the town that any excess funds every year would go into and, and that are not assigned that go into an unassigned fund balance. Um, so our policy is that it's between 16 and 20 percent of um, total annual expenditures and we are currently over that. I wanted to um, and, and I know that part of this forecast we're using the 1.48 million um, I wanted to get the actual number of unassigned fund balance as it is today. I think I remember from the Sustainable Budget Task Force that we were in the $12 million range, um, but I wanted to see if we could get that number again. I can look it up real quick. You are right. It's in the $12 million range. I, I, I believe it's in the $12 million range, um, Ness, and, uh, and anticipated. Uh, usage is for um, right now anyway is for offsetting the cost for foster school uh, public safety facility uh, tennis courts over at the high school and fire capital projects right so of that and then we are going to use a portion of that or we're proposing to use a portion of that unassigned fund balance to plug the hole this year and and hope that um, we can continue to have these discussions on an override if that ends up happening um, and I would put a plug in, given I was on the committee and we had made the recommendation that the Sustainable Budget Task Force continue. Um, I think it was an invaluable um, use of time and I would, I would strongly recommend that we continue that work. So thank you. Great, thank you. Michelle, did you have your hand up? 
I did. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, sorry, I did. Um, sorry, I'll say it now because Michelle was kind enough to unmute me. Um, but it was really just sort of reiterating um, what Ness and Liza were commenting on. And just to say that we all got a lot of late breaking news between the forecast and the um, potential uh, 1.7 from the school department. I think um, one thing to clarify, though, I feel like we're using the word surplus from the school committee budget. But to Davaline's point, it's not necessarily a surplus yet, right? We still got almost four months of school left to go before June 30th. So, so some or, or all of those funds um, could be used. And I think to Liza's point though, um, I think we've got a lot of work to do over the next probably 48 hours to figure out how can we best utilize any funds that we didn't um, use this year for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons that we didn't utilize all those funds. How can we best put them to use on both behalf of our students in town, but also on behalf of the town and figure out a way to get forward so that we can try to find a way to fund some of these positions we need for next year as well and take care of all the other needs across the town. So appreciate all the work that we're all gonna be doing over the next 48 hours. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I appreciate the presentation as well and um, have been digesting it since we, we received it um, as well as the as John's pres presentation yesterday. I just, I wanna reiterate um, when it comes to the school, the school department additional asks um, we did give the superintendent and uh, business manager the direction to only put in things that were crucial structural deficits to running the school, uh, the school department. Um, these are things that other towns, our size and demographics have um, and keep everything running smoothly um, are more cost efficient in the long run because they resulted in they if you're running smoothly and doing things the way you're supposed to, you're less likely to get into trouble and to have more costs. So that's kind of why we asked for the things we did. There were a very long list of things we didn't ask for. We felt like it was more responsible to go through the strategic planning process and kind of map those out and see um, and work with the town and see when the best times are to do it and also and to look for efficiencies too. So we, we were really careful about that. And I just remind everyone that we proposed a 1.43% budget increase, which is the lowest I've seen um, since I've been paying attention. Uh, John, did you want to say something? No, we can't hear oh, you. Only, only, only if you finish, Carrie. I mean, yep, I, I, I can wait. I just wanted to ask another question about the stabilization fund usage. You know, because I, I know that, you know, so, I mean, I see a couple of years ago, 300,000 was used. I don't know if some debt dropped off. And I was just wondering if I know there's $2 million there, and I know we brought it back to the 178, but <clears throat> when I sort of read the new regulation, I didn't, I didn't quite um, understand if it's totally impossible to sort of match the stabilization usage with the debt that's actually used for those particular buildings. Like I'm assuming a couple of the big overrides that may still be here, um, you know, have to do with East School and 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 the um, middle school, and I didn't know if that debt could say, hey, well, as long as we're increasing this and we're paying towards that debt, whatever that normal balance would be, would that not be a proper use of stabilization fund, you know, just to see I, that 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 was just an, uh, a thought that I had. John, I believe the regulation says you can use it to offset the interest not the principal. And the, yeah, and, but is the interest amount too? So the interest, we pay regular amounts on principal, but the interest doesn't amount to more than 178 on those two debt instruments? No, it does not. It's at, okay. cause it's, they're at, they're at the, the, the end. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and I just wanted to reiterate Dave and others um, suggestion that people read the sustainable budget task force report, it is really excellent work and specifically when I talk about structural deficits with the school department. Um, I would suggest taking a look at the last paragraph in page 13 and onto the next page it gives a it gives a brief history of why. Um, these these deficits are there. Um, so I, I would ask everyone to if you read it already, maybe take another look or if you haven't um, read the whole thing because it's great. So I think that's it for the school committee. Okay, thank you. Um, this may, uh, I'll call on Eric Valentine um, 
I know that we're up next for the capital outlay, but if you or anyone in your group has questions on the fiscal year 23 financial forecast. Uh, not at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, then we can move on to the fiscal year 23 capital outlay committee recommendations. And Eric, I will return the floor to you. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, and is there anything that you want uh, up on the up on the screen? Uh, no, I should. I, uh, I guess I should have uh, prepared a PowerPoint or uh, something to look at. But um, I guess we haven't typically, so I didn't do it uh, this year. But I can make a note to to uh, include some graphics next year. Um, so. Uh, I just want to correct the record that uh, Matt Goulet is also uh, ADCOM uh, representative participating in the meeting uh, this evening that I, I initially missed. Um, okay, so for uh, fiscal 23, um, our, and we followed our, annual, our typical annual review process in which we meet with each, uh, each of the departments uh, requesting capital items. Um, we will discuss in detail all of their um, Current requests to understand the nature um, of, of, of each request, the need, uh, priority, etc. Um, after all the after all the department meetings, uh, we will uh, meet as a committee and deliberate over which items to fund um, with our uh, projected budget for that fiscal year. We use a um, a pre a pre established review criteria. Um, which includes, uh, you know, safety risk. Uh, is the item broken? Is it core to the department? Uh, does it require significant repairs? Um, and we will assign a priority to each of the items, um, either uh, annual one, two, or three. Um, annual items are uh, recurring capital needs of the departments. Um, some examples are IT asset replacement, uh, bulletproof vests for the police, fire turnout gear, uh, school technology, and uh, and then there's a priority one which would be a, you know, it's a safety risk, the item is broken or, or it's uh, core to the department's mission. Um, so, so for some fiscal 23 metrics, um, the total capital requests that we received uh, to be funded from the tax levy this year was uh, 5.2 million. Um, based on our 2.7 uh, projected budget, we we're able to fund approximately 52% uh, of those. Um, some notable items are uh, there's 915,000 of annual baseline uh, capital expenditures, um, and then the balance 1.8 um, was for uh, you know was uh, priority one items. Some of the priority one items were um, 722k for the police, which included 378k for seven uh, hybrid cruisers, 145k for police dash cams and radios and 139K for police body cams um, required under the new um, uh, police union contract. Um, we're, uh, we're recommending funding uh, 220K for, uh, for the DPW for a new front end loader, which, is, um, which was purchased in 2013 and 180,000 for um, IT to replace uh, and upgrade the edge network switches for the entire town, excluding the schools. Um, of the 2.7 million fiscal 23 capital funding, uh, we allotted 884K or 33% to the school department um, and based on uh, 1.7 million requested. Um, of the total requests, 11% were new or 0.3 million and 89% were, were replacement uh, or, or four replacements um, or 2.4 million. Um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, the uh, the town uh, financial uh, policy um, for capital expenditures expenditures was updated uh, to be uh, three you know, three to six percent of the uh, fiscal year operating budget, um, and that was revised from two to five percent uh, for fiscal 23. Based on current estimates, we don't expect the fiscal 23 capital spending to be uh, from the tax levy. Uh, to be within the policy range, uh, um, and we're at 2.7% uh, of, of the operating budget, and that's based on a 98.1 million um, operating budget, um, which takes me into, um, my, I guess, my annual uh, soapbox stand that the capital outlay uh, needs additional funding. 
Um, we continue to defer requests that should be funded, uh, you know, due to the limited budget. Uh, our capital back backlog, which is, you know, the out four years uh, within our five-year plan, uh, continues to cre in increase year over year. So in fiscal 19, it was uh, 14.9 million. And this year, it's, it's uh, looking to be 26.5 million. Um, so that's just going to keep growing unless we um, figure out a, a long-term solution. Uh, using some of the unassigned fund balance, uh, you know, might be good for a you know a year to plug a gap, but that's not a long-term solution um, to fund capital. And and uh, and 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 in that regard, we you know we we support the sustained budget report recommendations of um, assigning the ambulance revenue to, uh, to fund new uh, new ambulance purchases, which um, is planned to be every two years. Um, as well as we support, you know, implementing transfer station fees to fund, you know, either specific DPW capital items or uh, just overall additional capital item items. And so, I guess in conclusion, um, the uh, the committee uh, has recommended uh, capital funding, you know, by source of 2.7 million from the tax levy, 125,000 from the municipal waterways fund for Harbor Master. Uh, capital items and 4.3 million um, from user rates and fees for the uh, country club, uh, rec department, sewer department, and uh, water company. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Okay, Eric, um, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, have, again, select board members, then the various committees. And then I'm going to uh, open up to the public uh, this entire discussion on the uh, financial forecast, both um, uh, capital outlay as well as the, uh, the financial forecast update that we previously covered. Uh, so I will start uh, with uh, Michelle, any questions? I'm sorry, not Michelle. Liz, any, any questions on the um, capital outlay presentation? Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Eric. Um, I know that there, are a lot of deferred items here. Can you give us a sense of how how long some of these items have been on the list? I know I, I'm pretty sure it's more than five years. So can you just give us a sense of that? Um, well, I'm not I'm not sure anything gets deferred more than five years. But a good example is the DPW. They you know a lot of their uh, Randy Sylvester has a schedule with all the equipment of DPW and you know you know a greater portion than the, you know than i think the town school would would, would uh, like are you know well beyond their useful life you mm -hmm. know 10 12 14 years of uh, a lot of the trucks and um, heavy equipment and so um for example the, uh, randy requested 1.1 million of capital requests this year and we were only able to fund 220,000 right okay thank you um one thing related to the the police, the um, the body wear cameras. I, I know at one point we had talked about um, using grant money or applying for a grant. Yeah, so um, the chief, uh, you know, is planning to, um, you know, apply for the grant if he hasn't already, and um, you know, hopefully have a, a the grant one hundred percent fund that. And if um, you know if that is successful, then. Um, we will repurpose those uh, those funds for the body cameras of 139k to to other capital items. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work on this. I know it's not easy. Okay. Liz, just I can help answer some of that last question just real quick. The um, the police department the application window opens in April uh, for the body cams, and uh, and Chief Jones is certainly um, prepared to submit the application for full funding. Great. Thank you. Oh. oh, Ramsey, are you there? Thanks, Giles. I'm muted. Um, uh, Eric, thank you for your uh, presentation. I appreciate the committee's work. My only uh, point was to follow up on Liz's question, um, was, and that is the chief. I um, uh, was pretty confident we're going to get fully funded for the uh, body cameras. So, Hopefully that number will come off of the budget here, but thank you. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, uh, yeah, that's what the 
you know, chiefs, you know, communicated to us, but because it was in the, the, the new police uh, union contract, we didn't want to not fund it in, in the event that the, you know, the grant funding didn't come through. Sure. Understood. Thanks, Eric. Great. Um, Eric, this is uh, directly related to capital expenditures and it may be beyond your committee's um, information, but often there are um, entities engaging in capital replacement work um, in order to bring down the cost of repair. Um, and you know, obviously you know, a new vehicle, you don't have to repair as much as an older one. Um, do you have any sense uh, to what extent our operating budget is adversely affected by deferred capital? Um, I mean, not, not holistically. Um, so, the, you know, when, the, when uh, a department is, you know, submitting a capital request, they will outline the, you know, the history of the vehicle and say, okay, there's been a thousand dollars of repairs on this vehicle or $5,000 of repairs in this vehicle. Um, but, uh, but, uh, you know, as far as an entire, uh, operating budget impact, um, we don't have that visibility. I'm just really just picking up on, on Liz's point that, um, to the extent that we've had deferred items, um, our inability to move forward with a capital plan, uh, I suspect has had an adverse impact impact on our operating budget. Um, and that there isn't a, a relationship and the sooner we can get our hands around the uh, moving forward with the capital plan, uh, the better off the town will be from an operational standpoint. Um, with that, I will turn it over to um, the advisory committee and Julie. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Michelle, can you pull up the uh, spreadsheet again and scroll to the bottom where the footnotes are? Tell me when to stop or when okay. to go. Uh, go up a little bit more. Go down a little more. Oh, sorry. Um, um, I'm looking for, well, actually, so I'll just ask the question. Um, it's here in uh, footnote number two. So Eric, can you just explain, advisory committee took up the article for fire department capital, large capital needs. But if you can just explain for everyone um, the situation where there are many, many asks that the fire department um, needed to have fulfilled and um, what that budget was compared to your whole capital outlay budget. Oh yeah, so um, I think a hand, I think all these all these uh, items, you know, individual items, uh, you know, being potentially funded through a Warren article, you know, were on the um, on, on prior year uh, uh, capital plans, and they they you know they're just so large, you know, seven hundred ninety thousand dollars for a a new pumper truck, um, you know, is a, a third of our budget. Um, and so we just don't have the ability to fund, you know, significantly large items like that with our 2.7, you know, for fiscal 23 uh, capital budget. Um, and so, you know, it was welcome news when this uh, Warren article was proposed to uh, bundle these, um, these, these large items for the fire department, as well as you know, you know, much needed repairs for, for station one and station three. Um, you know, the pictures we've seen that the, the chief has provided and the, and the details of the, of the situation, especially station one, um, you know, made it evident that, you know, these, uh, these repairs were, you know, critical and, and needed. Thanks, Eric. And the, the funding source for that article is on assigned fund balance. Nancy? Uh, okay, so there won't be a Warren article for that? No, it is a Warren article. Oh, but okay, the, but from- the funds uh, will come okay. out of okay. unassigned fund balance. Yeah. Nancy? Oh, there it is. Sorry. Um, I, uh, and Eric, if, if you want me to take this offline, I, I totally appreciate that. You made a comment that, um, that you support the um, having a transfer station fee. And I'm trying to understand um, since presumably every household in town 
would use a, uses the DPW, um, how, how is the fee that would be applied evenly across the whole town? Why is that? Why would, and this is just, I'm just tr truly trying to understand. Why is that preferable to just folding it into a larger capital outlay budget? Well, no, I mean, I think that that's, I mean, my point was that that could be a potential new revenue or funding source that could be used for capital items. And, and so, I don't know, I think it's more, it'd be more pal palatable for the townspeople to, you know, I, I think I'll, I'm no expert on this, but it seems like, you know, most surrounding towns have a, like a pay as you throw, or, you know, um, you have to pay for at least one, you know, dump uh, transfer station sticker. And so, so if, you know, in the example that, you know, we do a transfer, some type of transfer station fee to fund the transfer station capital, capital items that would directly align with the users. Um, and, you know, I, I would say not every, I would say it's probably a, a large percentage does not use the transfer station. I've heard there's 30 uh, independent trash companies in town. Um, so that would directly align with, with the users. Okay. I didn't realize it was 30%. And I thought, I thought no, not 30%, 30 companies. Do they, right. And I thought, didn't, don't they, I've seen the, um, one guy at the dump doesn't, don't they use the services of the Oh, mission? maybe they do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll take this offline. Thank you. Andy? Um, <clears throat> uh, a question on fund balance. At, at one point, Michelle, uh, I think you presented um, uh, the budget. You made a budget presentation to us that, that, that included a slide which showed the uh, suggested fund balance expenditures, including the money for the uh, to offset the um, to foster and to offset the public safety facility. You don't happen to have that slide handy, do you? I have a spreadsheet that can pull that up. Okay. Uh, or or uh, alternatively, I guess, uh, while you're doing that, let me try to ask my question. If I recall that slide correctly, it, it ended up with a, a bottom line of 1.9 million remaining in excess fund balance. Um, is that... I think you're talking about this. Yes, yes, precisely. Is that still a number uh, or is, has that been reduced um, by the use in the, to offset some of the operating expenses in the uh, zeroed out, uh, budget you presented tonight. Michelle, do you want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. So Andy, it's a great question. Um, we were talking about this today. I think uh, two things are important to remember. One is the reason we were leaving $2 million in excess fund balance in the account is because that is the 10 year average of fund balance used at town meeting, whether it's for reserve fund transfers or, um, or articles, et cetera. Uh, that, that go beyond the the capital budget or other things. So that was why we wanted to leave $2, two million in excess fund balance in there. And where we're now using 1.5 million from fund balance to balance to end ultimately to balance the budget. Our thought was that we would apply, we would remake this chart to lower the amount being used to offset foster and public safety by that <laughs> in the amount equal to that 1.5. So uh, to to uh, be able to maintain the maintain the two million dollar reserve that you That's anticipate right. will will be expended. Okay. I, yeah. um, all right. I, I was I was going to suggest that that be uh, given to the capital outlay committee, but uh, I won't because Sue's on the line. <laughs> you all set, Andy. Yeah, I just want to say as as the one of the two ADCOM members of Capital Outlay, 
Um, first, I just want to thank Eric for a tr tremendous amount of work he does as chair. Um, and I, I think people, I mean, this um, handout should show that and all of these notes. And I also want to note that our, our overall capital spending is more than just our, our 2.7 because we have these major capital projects. But I will say this is now, I guess I've been on Capital Outlay for about two and a half years, almost three. It is um, really sad to see the number of requests we have that are valid, important, needed requests that we can't, we simply can't fund. And there are particularly certain kinds of, of requests that are harder to fund, you know, some of the things that might relate, for example, to preservation of a town owned historic building. If you're comparing that against, um, you know, body vests for the police or something like that, I mean, it's just really hard decisions because there's just not enough money there. And I think in the long run, we do pay a price by deferring things. And I also want to give a shout out to many of the town departments that simply come in knowing they're not going to get everything they request. And so they have prioritized, you know, this, this, we really have to have this, we could wait a year on this, we could wait a year on that. And it doesn't seem like that's the best position to put our department heads in. So I do hope as we continue, we can have more capital outlay and, and certainly and you see it in the school budget for capital requests as well. Usually the school request would also equal our budget. So there's, you know, it's just, it's a very tough, very tough decision. So I just want to give thanks to the committees and also to the department heads. That's it. Thanks, Dibleen. Great points. Anyone else from advisory committee have any questions for capital outlay? Okay, we're all set. Thank you, Julie. Before I go to the school committee, I saw Steve Murphy turn on his camera and it looked like he was gonna make a comment. So um, Chief Murphy, if you're there, if, if there was something that you wanted to add, uh, now's your chance. Uh, no, I was just gonna comment on the, um, that article um, for yeah. the fire department and the needs, but um, the question was answered, so thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, school committee, Carrie Nate. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, Eric, and to Capital Outlay. Um, it, that's a tremendous amount of work and um, and you really did have to make some tough decisions. So we, we really appreciate all you're doing for the town. Um, does anyone on the school committee have any questions for Capital Outlay? If you'd use the raise hand. Uh, Liza? Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to thank Eric for his work. And I certainly hope that when we address all the override issues that capital is taken into consideration and in the overall vision of how we're moving forward, because every year I've been serving, um, this is a repetitive issue. And I hope that we can consider this with every other ask that people have been looking at and what the Sustainable Budget Task Force, how they covered this too in their report. So thank you, Eric, for all your work and your whole committee. You're welcome. John? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, I wanted to also say thanks to, to Eric. I mean, him and his the team and David Lane and, and, and Matt, they, they work incredibly hard. And I know, you know, we go through these three hour meetings and we explain, you know, all the all of the things that we need for, you know, to, to maintain 10 buildings and to do the, the major repairs that are necessary. So we keep them in shape and we're not um, always in, in the process of saying, hey, you know, five years down the road, we're gonna need a new building here. Um, I, I really do believe that you know we need a we need a good capital plan going forward, one that's going to be adequate funding to take care of all of the assets that we have really in town. I, I mean, I'm and there's this is not a complaint, but I just to, as a point of reference, so I can kind of explain it to everybody here because this is where all the decision makers are. This is where all the people are that guide this town. 
there's you know the school budget of eight hundred eighty three thousand dollars to maintain ten buildings or you know nine buildings, ten buildings. You know, building twelve is out of commission, so we're not doing anything on building twelve anymore. We just hope that it doesn't fall down at some point. But so net net eight hundred eighty three thousand dollars. I know we got the tennis courts, which which is good, but that was a joint article, and you know, and there's money in there. When you see the eight million, million you're seeing the, there's a PRS revote from last year. And there's some interim funding for foster that's absolutely necessary so we keep that project on pace. And, and I know the school committee as well as the building committee, we all appreciate that investment that we make into those buildings. But from a maintenance and an annual year by year perspective, $883,000, $486,000 of that is technology in the schools. That gets used and expended every year. That's a recurring charge. That isn't capital. So, I mean, net net, I end up with $397,000 to try to do major capital repairs on 10 buildings. It's not a lot of money. You know, we, we really, as a town, we, re, we'll, we really need to uh, create a focus and get a good capital process and give capital outlay appropriate funding to, to, to address what we need in the town. And thank you. That's it. And, and thanks, Eric, and the folks for doing everything. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. You know, I, I would, yeah, I would uh, reiterate that, you know, a strategic or, you know, a capital, you know, townwide capital plan that identifies all assets and, you know, their useful lives and the, you know, you can do the life cycle cost analysis and um, just something that, you know, it's all encompassing it so that, you know, the town is able to plan and say, oh, okay, it's not a surprise, um, you know, million dollar expenditure that needs to be done this year. Um, it can be planned out and, you know, significant repairs can be avoided. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point from both of you. Um, does anyone else have any questions for the school committee? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so thank you again. Thank you, and Eric. Thank, thank, thank you for the presentation. Uh, hey, you're welcome. Uh, just, uh, I just like to say thanks for all the kind accolades, but the, you know, got to acknowledge the rest of the committee. Uh, it's a team effort, and uh, so couldn't do without them. So thank you, guys. So at this point, we are on. We're still on item six on our agenda, and I am going to open up for public comments, um, and that's public comments on the fiscal year 23 financial forecast as well as the uh, financial, the fiscal year 23 capital outlay committee recommendations. So uh, if there are members of the public who've got questions, uh, please raise your hand and uh, begin by giving us your name and address. And I see immediately John Borger. So you have the floor. Thank you, uh, John Borger, 53 Lafayette Avenue. Um, it's obvious you folks are wrestling with hellish issues. So um, uh, we in Higgin Net Zero uh, salute you. There's a wonderful <laughs> Latin saying by the gladiators, something to the effect that we who are about to die salute you. And uh, this is a tough, this is a tough um, nut to crack. Um, many of our members are also at the All Town Band concert. But we were asked, if possible, to get a sense of what the process and the timelines are from this point to arrive at the, quote, final budget that will be presented in this warrant article. And we understand from the, the FY23 forecast tonight that the budget currently um, is balanced. There's zero deficit, which means that the um, additional positions that came from a variety of, of sectors, um, including the sustainability positions, the sustainability coordinator and the grant writer are not in there correct uh, right now. I, I think that's correct. Um, so my question is, will there be further discussions between the ADCOM and the select board or at this point, as it seems from the agendas that we're looking at for, for the balance of meeting times tonight and, and on Thursday and maybe next week, are there basically going to unfold separate discussions 
and of course the adcom presumably being this dispositive um the reason i ask is that our members would like to know that would like to participate appropriately and um you know what we want to help them try to navigate through the process at this point so if you could speak to briefly process going forward in time frames that would be um much appreciated thank you great tom do you want to uh review the process sure thank you joe um, so thanks for the question, John, as usual, um, a well thought through question. Uh, what we're um, what we're looking at, I think, tonight is a select board will be uh, discussing uh, article. Well, right now it's Article F. It will soon become Article 6. Um, and then uh, in that discussion, they will um, well, we'll see what they do. But <laughs> there will be a discussion about what the appropriate way to fund the budget is going forward. Uh, again, Michelle and I um, have put together a path toward, towards a balanced budget, and that will be discussed um, by the select board tonight, possibly voted, and then sent to the advisory committee for their uh, in-depth discussion. As I think we heard uh, Julie Straley discuss, um, say earlier, uh, ACES has a meeting, I think, scheduled for tomorrow, uh, and then they're taking up the budget discussion on Thursday. Um, so hypothetically, if the ADCOM decided to vote that on Thursday, then, and it was in any way different than what the select board votes, if they do tonight, then, um, then my guess is the select board would, uh, would either um, not reconsider or, or reconsider at a future meeting, which would likely be uh, the 15th. Did I have enough qualifiers in there, Joe? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, that was that, that was uh, absolutely uh, crystal clear. Thank you, Tom. Right. But, I, but ju just to add to that, John, and just to be clear, the, what we've heard so far is the financial forecast, not yeah. the budget. It's been characterized in the discussions as the budget that the, we will get to the budget when we reach item eight on our agenda. Um, right now, we, we have the financial forecast that, that Tom's presented. Um, and so there will be further discussions on the budget this evening. Uh, and then as, as Tom said, it, it moves forward uh, to the advisory committee. Okay, great. Thanks very much, appreciate it. Could I add to that, please? Please, so The Julie. advisory committee will have its own budget discussion tonight, but we will not be taking up the full bar budget article until Thursday night. We'll have discussion and then we'll take up article six and We'd like to vote the budget that night, but we might not vote the budget that night. And if so, then we would um, defer it to next Tuesday and we would try to vote the budget next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Any other members of the public with questions? I see no further hands raised. Uh, Michelle or Tom, do you? I do not, no. Okay, so uh, at this point, I think we have now concluded our number six agenda item, and I'll ask the uh, school committee if you are prepared to adjourn your committee at this point. Um, yes, we are. Somebody like to make a motion to adjourn. I think we have to unmute the school committee. Yeah. Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting. I'll second. Thank you, Ness. All in favor? Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? I don't know if Carlos is still on. Um, Liza? Aye. Carlos, could you unmute yourself, please? Okay, I guess Carlos is abstaining. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the, uh, the uh, meeting of the school committee is adjourned. Thank you. And then uh, capital outlay, Eric. I don't. I'm not sure. Did you formally convene? I think you did. Yep. So, yeah, uh, we did. So, uh, raise motion to adjourn the capital outlay committee meeting. So moved. All in favor. Before we vote, there should be a second. Second, Eric. Okay. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Mike, it's I. 8, it's 8.36. The Capital LA Committee is adjourned.
Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is, uh, and we are still with the advisory committee, uh, to uh, consider article GG, which is the real estate uh, transfer fee. Um, and it's my intention that we have a, a discussion about that. Uh, we have had, uh, I know I've had individual discussions uh, with uh, various members of the advisory committee and members of the public. Uh, I suspect that my fellow board members have had their discussions. Um, there has been a lot of back and forth, really good ideas. Um, I'm just going to preface our discussion with my observation that um, at this point, I don't think the, um, this amendment or this proposal is ready for prime time. I think it needs further discussion, review, refinement, so that uh, what we come up with is something that works best for the town and has the greatest likelihood of being accepted by the state legislature as, as we move forward. Um, so I, I wanna move forward with this discussion, uh, but with that as a preface that it would, it's my expectation uh, that uh, after the discussion, uh, we will likely uh, not move forward with Article GG and put that on the, on the burner for uh, next town meeting, not, not the upcoming one. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, begin by talking to uh, Liz and Bill uh, about your thoughts on Article GG. And I'll, I'll, Bill, I'll start with you. Yeah, so Joe, thank you for that. You know, I would agree with that. Um, I, I think I, I would uh, applaud the, uh, the task force for bringing the discussion forward. And I think we had a discuss good discussion on it last week. I did watch the advisory committee meeting uh, last week on it. I, I heard some great points uh, mentioned by the committee members, but I would agree with you. I think it's good that this needs to be socialized a little more. Um, I, I'm interested in hearing uh, more comments tonight. I think this will benefit from it being socialized through our, commu uh, through our community, but also I'm interested to see as this legislation makes its way through um, the legislature, how, other, how uh, it takes shape in other communities and how other communities adopt it. I mean, we know um, the legislation exists in Nantucket. We know how Nantucket has implemented it. It's a 1% fee, uh, sorry, it's a 2% fee uh, borne by the, um, the buyer and it goes directly toward open space. We know that um, there's a um, uh, there is a legislation coming, you know, from Boston that's going to go directly toward affordable housing. Some other communities have other suggestions. So I think we, as a community, will benefit to see how other towns or municipalities implement it. So it's a good start to this discussion. Um, I would uh, emphasize the point that our board made that. Um, we, knew, we need to look at um, additional funding sources other than the levy uh, to fund a lot of the, the capital needs we have in this town. And I think this is one of several ideas that um, we're gonna be talking about over the, over the next year and future years, um, but it's um, a good discussion to have and I look forward to hearing the comments of our colleagues tonight. So thank you. Great, Liz. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Bill. Um, I think if, if there's one message I heard loud and clear tonight is we need additional revenue. So I, I hope that people have an open mind about what that looks like, um, certainly as it relates to capital projects. I think we're all feeling that we need, we need additional revenue sources. Um, I have been very impressed with the, the level of engagement around this, um, this proposal. I have appreciated hearing people's comments and opinions and feedback. Um, I also listened to the AgCon meeting um, and you know, it, was, it was great to hear all the different perspectives. Um, I've also spoken with a realtor in town as well as select board members in our surrounding communities. So I think there, there's more work to be done there to understand um, exactly how it impacts our taxpayers, um, the commercial base, as well as you know, if we're gonna kind of go try to go forward for, with a regional approach, what what our surrounding communities are doing. So, I I do want this to continue uh, to be studied in earnest. I think it was a, a great recommendation that the Sustainable Budget Task Force put forth. 
Um, so I would like to see that that work continue and you know over the next few months and um, you know have it be considered seriously by the community because I do think there's some good potential there. Yeah, Thanks, Liz, I, I I would you know, echo the point that there is a need for funds. There's no question about it. And um, the task force identified this. Uh, I know there was input from the public suggesting this. Um, the issues that at least I've identified is if we're having the transfer fee, uh, on whom is it assessed? Is it the buyer, the seller, some combination? Is it residential, commercial, both? Um, and what percentage? And should it be the same percentage for residential and commercial? Um, how should the funds be applied? Uh, affordable housing, which is uh, there's currently pending a statewide uh, legislative bill that would have this sort of fee applied to um, for affordable housing should be used for environmental uh, improvement purposes, capital expenditures. So, you know, there there are a number of questions. Um, the uh, discussion at, at the, the advisory committee opened up a lot of issues. Um, and I think the next step is for the town to assess what is in our best interests and also recognizing that once we approve it, it requires legislative approval and then once it has that legislative approval, it will be difficult for us to amend it. So this is not like we the, the select board or town meeting vote something and if it doesn't work out well, we can just adjust it a little bit. Um, it may be locked in place by legislative action at the state level. So we really wanna make sure we get this right, um, but it is something that is definitely worth pursuing. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to uh, turn this over to the advisory committee, Julie, if you have um, members of your committee who have comments, questions, suggestions on how to proceed with respect to Article GG. Thanks, Joan. Bob? We can't hear you, Bob. Okay. There we go. There we go. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, thanks, Joe and, uh, and Bill and Liz. Um, uh, I couldn't agree more with the idea that we need more revenue in the town. And, and I think everybody on the advisory committee um, agrees with that. Um, I think the uh, best way to uh, get that additional revenue is, is not with something like Article GG, but it is through a comprehensive and thoughtful override that is going to increase the tax levy and it's going to basically increase it for almost everyone. Uh, it would increase it more for people with properties that are assessed higher um, and uh, for properties that are subject to the exemptions from the tax levy, all of which I think are good. Um, they would pay uh, less. Um, so it's, it's not actually a progressive system, but I think it's better than this proposal. Um, I certainly agreed with the exemption part of this proposal. I, I had circulated to all of you uh, this evening as a handout uh, a couple of pages of comments that I sent to Kristen uh, earlier today. And um, they, they come out of a lot of thought and discussion. I had a very uh, productive exchange of ideas with Tom Mayo uh, on Monday. I, I spoke to Alyssa Tully at length um, uh, also on Monday uh, about this article. So I, I don't necessarily want to extend the night for everybody by reading through what you can already read through, but perhaps it would be beneficial for at least um, me to go through the basic points that I'd like to make. Um, and I, I'm seeing this as an unfair tax on a small subset of people, uh, and especially on people that are not presently um, 
uh, members of our ham community. And uh, I, I think about a young family desiring to move to Hingham that finally cobbles together the two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to buy the now million dollar starter home in in Hingham, and uh, they're basically being asked to pay the equivalent of two months of property taxes on that purchase. Uh, an extra $5,000 that nobody else has ever paid in, in the town of Hingham uh, for the uh, privilege of, of moving to Hingham. I expect that many of those young families um, aren't even going to realize at the time they sign a purchase and sale agreement that such a uh, a tax is going to be imposed on them. And I, I do see this as a tax, not a fee. Fees are typically related directly to services, such as a transfer station or, uh, or my personal favorite greens fees. Um, but uh, the privilege of living in Hingham is, is not a service. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that um, it would be great for almost anybody to live in Hingham. So um, I, I think my fundamental objection to this is, is that it's unfair uh, and it, it doesn't um, broad, in a broad-based manner share the burden that we're trying to address. And I think that in Hingham, we have always been our best when we have stood together uh, collectively. Um, so uh, I, I synthesize some of that. Um, I, you know, at the AdCom meeting last week, it was suggested, well, uh, the young family can amortize the 5K over 20 years to uh, reduce the pain. But um, if you think about it, they're losing the opportunity cost of the $5,000, plus they're also paying interest on it. I, I looked up today an amortization schedule that indicated that at 4% over 20 years, they'd pay another $2,300. Uh, wouldn't it be much better for that young family to put that money in a college fund and um, in, in talking with Lisa Tully yesterday, she told me that part of the genesis of this idea was that the folks who sold Broadco made $100 million profit. And, and the town didn't get the share in that profit. But the more I thought about that, um, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it seems to me that the developers have added um, $100 million of value to the real estate tax base. And that that additional $100 million of value to the tax base is going to generate higher property taxes year after year after year. So I, I while I'm somewhat receptive to the idea of uh, maybe this is a, a, a tax that could be imposed on businesses. Um, I think that that requires very careful study of the uh, consequences and potentially the unintended consequences of, of that type of uh, uh, tax. I recognize that Hingham has the right to tax businesses at a higher rate than individuals. And I think that part of the future study should uh, think about if we really wanna go in this direction, and I don't think we do, um, whether some combination of business and residential with different rates should be involved. Um, I, I, I have said to everybody that I've talked about with this, you know, if, if this kind of fee or tax is to be assessed, I, I'm the one that ought to be taxed. 
I mean, I, I've lived in Hingham for over 40 years. I've, I've had all the benefits. I've, my, my property values have increased unbelievably. Uh, I recognize that, um, you know, in the sustainability, uh, of the St sustainable budget task force, that I have been undertaxed vis-a-vis uh, -vis our benchmark communities. And to the extent that we haven't invested in capital as I wish we uh, would have in the past, uh, I'm also a beneficiary of the lack of that capital investment. Um, so I, I think there's something to be said about uh, people that have had the benefits and, and the wealth generation that has generally been involved in, in living in Hingham, uh, maybe they're the ones that should uh, bear the burden or at least share the burden of any such uh, new uh, revenue source. And I, I do think that uh, any proposed legislation should include a mandatory disclosure provision um, to um, buyers or sellers or whoever is going to bear the burden of this tax so that they can uh, enter uh, into meaningful financial negotiations. Uh, if they don't know about the tax, they certainly can't negotiate it into the price or maybe even more importantly, into their financing. If they do know about the tax, uh, the sales price is going to go up. And um, then the property taxes is going to go up. And effectively, you have a tax on a tax. So I, I think I've covered most of what I wanted to say. I tried to make it succinct. And I'll be delighted to hear the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And Kristen, I'd like to actually just point out Kristen's hard work on this article, which for this town meeting will be all for naught, but I just wanted to thank her for sticking with this article and, and learning all the different twists and turns as we've gone in the way. So thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> um, I just wanna start off by saying I agree with Bob that you know an override is in inevitable and it's gonna help our community. But again, there's no guarantee that that's gonna pass at a town meeting. So we can't rely on something like that. Um, and we also still need to look at revenue streams coming in. And this is one of the biggest revenue streams that the Sustainable Task Force looked at that could actually generate money for this town. So. You know, I had the privilege of sitting in on all of those meetings where they went th through all the possibilities of the town generating money. And this was the biggest one. And I just think people really need to think about it. Um, you know, people look at the override and they say it's going to hurt low income. It's going to hurt the elderly. And then now people look at this and say, oh, this is going to hurt, you know, incoming families and so forth, middle class. Um, but any type of fee tax is going to have an effect on some sort of group in the town. And that's just something that we're just going to have to deal with as a town. You know, every year we're coming up short and different groups are asking for more and want more from the town, but we can't pay for it. So we need to look at these hard decisions and say, yeah, it's going to cost some money, but this is where we're gonna get our money from. So just want people to think about it that way too, um, that we're short with money. You know, like you can't emphasize that enough. And although I agree that, you know, it's not the right time for this yet, there's a lot of different pieces that we need to look at further and um, assess and get to a better place with this article, you know, possibly next year, but um, it's, it's a revenue stream that we could lock into. So I just want people to continue to think about that going forward. Thanks, Kristen. Andy? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I agree with uh, virtually everything Bob said, except his ante penultimate 
point, which was that uh, there should be a solid tax and that he thinks those of us who have uh, seen an increase in the value of our homes are uh, should be paying more in taxes and that we have been under tax. I, I want to register my disagreement with Bob's sentiment on that. On a more serious note, I just want to add uh, three or four additional points. Um, uh, I will conclude by saying um, it is highly important to me that uh, we do have a study of the potential consequences on both the residential side and the commercial side. That, that is my, gonna be my bottom line here. Uh, I will uh, use the phrase taxation without representation because with regard to young families who have not moved into the town, they're obviously not gonna be at the town meeting that votes for this proposal, but uh, they're gonna be the, the uh, recipients of a uh, large tax bill when they when they are welcome to hang them uh, hardly uh, a, a very uh, endearing welcome uh, to town so and 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 reemphasize the point that Bob made you have a very very small subset of, uh, I think in the sustainable budget task force report there was a suggestion of maybe 400 people uh, paying an additional two million dollars to support the entire services for the entire town uh, or capital improvements for the entire town. And that, that is not something that uh, Hingham uh, has ever done or, or I think we ever want to do to, to select such a small group uh, of unrepresented uh, potential homeowners uh, to pay the cost uh, for benefits to be shared by the entire town. The uh, eight towns that are cited in the uh, draft comment um, <clears throat> to this article include uh, Provincetown, Nantucket and Chatham, uh, which of course are um, uh, places where many people have uh, large second homes. So I would exclude them. Uh, the, the five others, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Brookline, and Arlington are obviously much larger uh, than, uh, than Hingham. And uh, at least with respect to Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, and Brookline have much more substantial commercial uh, development than, than Hingham does. I, I believe the, of the eight towns, the only one uh, that we see on our uh, list of non-benchmark towns, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, is uh, Concord, uh, population of about 18,000, I think. Uh, and I would add to that, it's, it's not clear to me at all where the, the general legislation on this is going to end up. I know it, it, uh, it has to be special legislation uh, as it stands now on a town by town basis. But uh, I, I think some of these communities, including Boston, have submitted proposed legislation that has been stalled in the legislature. And, and I suspect uh, that it's gonna be very hard and, and hard, uh, hard fought because of the size of the developers uh, in the city of Boston and their uh, potential opposition uh, to this. Um, and my, my final point is one that uh, is, is sort of a, a, a two-pronged one. Uh, I believe I was told by a person who, who was in a position to know that real estate, residential real estate prices in Hingham increased 28% from 2020 to 2021. Uh, there, many homes, of course, are going for over the asking price. Um, the uh, attempt to negotiate something like this uh, is is non-existent, I think, in the current market. Um, and I think 
that is uh, that is all I have to add to what Bob has previously said. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> Excuse me, Sarah. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate um, the work to put this forward and to identify it as as a potential additional revenue source. I, I really appreciate thinking out of the box on that. Um, when we had our discussion about it the other night, I, I, I very much heard the equity concerns um, about putting it on buyers and, you know, not all of whom, but many of whom might be young families trying to move into town. Um, and, you know, I, I was, I was thinking about that quite a bit. And then further on that night on a, you know, different topic, I don't know what's the forecast or something else in, in, as part of the same meeting, we were talking about um, potentially, you know, looking at sources like raising athletic fees or fees to use school bus transportation. And, and that struck me as um, a little bit of a dissonance for me um, in that um, I, I think there are equity issues that can be addressed in putting an art, article GG forward, not, not this year, whatever it's called next year, um, like you say, uh, uh, deciding between buyer and seller how that's allocated, or um, I don't know if the exclusion amount uh, on the purchase price, it, I forget if that was set by, by a statute or I, it was tied to some metric, as I recall. Um, so I don't know how much say we would have in moving that number, but you know, excluding $500,000 from the application of this entirely, it, it does help with, with the equitable argument. And I think when you stack it against other measures on the table as drastic as raising athletic fees on you know, high school parents who are desperately trying to save for college um, and, and school bus user fees on, on families all across the income spectrum, many of whom you know, working fit, two parent working families have to use that. Um, I, I, that's where I think um, I really appreciate looking at all the sources and, and, and thinking more about, about implementing this the right way. Um, and that, that's all, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Dave? Thanks, Julie. Um, I just wanna echo Kristen's comments. I think she said it really well, and maybe she and I are both cursed with having spent a lot of time in the Sustainable Budget Task Force meetings. Um, but it, I, I think she said it better than I can. And I would just say that two things. Number one, I think we ask young parents with young kids to pay for a portion of kindergarten right now in this town. So I think when we start talking about where some of these expenses are visited, we ought to look comprehensively across that as well. Um, I would say that we should absolutely consider to look at this. I, I, you know, I respect where Andy and Bob are coming from. I think they raise excellent points, and, and I have my own questions about this in the big picture, but I certainly think looking at the landscape of potential revenue opportunities, you know, if we start just whacking them away, um, we're not going to be left with but one, and, um, and that's okay, and, but I think Kristen is right to point out that if we put all our eggs in that basket and it doesn't work out, um, we're back to square one, so I would just say, I, I, you know, it's, I, I'm not making a request to the select board or Tom or anybody, but I do hope, I imagine, I know Tom is, uh, is interested in looking at this more or has expressed that in, in public meetings. And so hopefully this does continue to get some exploration because I think it's worth um, seeing it to the conclusion and, and really testing some of these hypotheses. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Brenda? Hi, thank you. Um, just a couple of things that we brought up in our EdCon meeting that haven't been said tonight that I think should be said to the larger group, which is it does seem that the new family moving to town are the people who are going to get the most benefit from capital investment from the funds that they end up contributing to the town through the fee. So I think that should be paid attention to. And also that in terms of the equity issues, uh, as I relearned my math again, uh, the way the metric is set up is the median house price um, 
that 80% of that will be the amount that can be deducted from what one would be responsible for the fee for. So that means that in town right now, there are more than 50% of our houses that are valued less than $800,000 and that only the difference between the 500 and something and 700 and something uh, is the part that a family would be responsible for. So that's like $2,000. And I think most young families and, and new people moving to town will be making decisions like, do we buy new furniture for this new house or do we simply put all of our money into getting the house and then slowly furnishing things? So I think the amount of money is potentially reasonable. And I do think that we have to keep looking at what are the sources of potential revenue and how can we spread those costs across the town? This is one small bit for one group of people, but a fairly invested group of people for wanting to get good things out of being in town. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Does anyone else want to add their thoughts about GG or ask any questions? Okay. So, comes all set. Um, and this is exactly the kind of discussion that we were hoping to have to really hear the views of on both sides, or or it's not just both on various sides uh, so that we can craft something for consideration at an upcoming meeting and get your comments. And at that point, we'll figure out if it makes sense to move forward or not. Uh, I'd like though to hear uh, comments and questions from members of the public. So if there's any member of the public who wants to talk about um, what we have currently proposed as Article GG, which is a proposed transfer fee, uh, which would be assessed on transactions that were uh, in excess of, or the portion of the transaction that's in excess of 80% of the median value of a home. And I see Mary Power. Hi, Mary Power, One King Philopath. Um, thanks so much for a very good discussion. Um, while I agree with uh, Joe with what you're suggesting, which is that this article is not necessarily ready for this year's town meeting. Um, I think that's the right decision because you want an article to go to town meeting when it's able to put its best foot forward. And it feels like there's still too many open questions. But just listening to the discussion that has taken place since this meeting started, uh, between the five-year forecast and what looks to be a starting point of an override next year of $5.8 million, uh, with a desire to appropriately add more money into capital, uh, with the fact that we are going to reduce the amount of money uh, being used for tax relief for the capital projects this fall. Um, what that's going to translate to is if there is an override in FY24, between FY24 and FY26, Hingham taxpayers will be asked to absorb what, as I'm calculating, is between a 30 and a 40% tax increase within a three-year period. And I think that's gonna be a very difficult thing for many households to swallow. I would urge the select board to continue to keep this conversation going because it, it is an option that is definitely worth pursuing for all the reasons mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public? I am seeing none on my screen. Um, so I'm gonna turn back to uh, Liz and Bill for your final thoughts on, uh, on what you're, how you're feeling about uh, moving forward with Article GG, uh, either for this upcoming town meeting or for future meetings. I'll start with Liz. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for the feedback. I uh, certainly appreciate it. Um, and Kristen, thank you for your work studying this. It, it certainly is not wasted effort. I, I think we need to continue studying it. So that will be a, you know, a, a starting point for us. Um, I agree that there are more, there's more studying to be done. There are more questions to be answered. So I don't feel comfortable moving it forward for this town meeting. I do want to study it again in earnest, not put it on the back burner for next March, 
to actually study it consistently over the next several months, because I do think it's an important, it can be a, an important tool for us. Um, we've heard some discussion about this as a revenue source versus the override. I don't think it's one or the other. I think we need to be thinking about a comprehensive strategy that use multiple tools. There's going to need to be an override and there's going to be, the, there needs to be other revenue sources. We cannot, unless we do an override every year, this budget is not sustainable. That, that's, that should be the key takeaway. So there are multiple things that need to happen here, whether it's the real estate transfer fee or other sources of revenue in addition to an override. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Bill. Kristen, thank you for your work on the article as well. Appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, the comments of our AdCom colleagues very much. Um, so yeah, my position has not changed. I do think we should uh, uh, we should wait on this one and uh, it should be studied further at further discussion. But my other position that, you know, we are as a, as a select board, we are trying to come up with alternatives to raising property taxes in this town uh, is an important um, position that we are taking. And this is one, um, position where we uh, are going to continue to have. Um, you know, I remember a couple of years ago at town meeting, we had a discussion about the meals tax. And I know this is a much more complicated tax than the meals tax discussion. But, you know, at, at that town meeting, um, everybody talked about the restaurant industry was going to collapse in town because we were going to put uh, a 75 cent tax on, you know, the, um, meals in this town. And guess what? They did it. People don't even know it's on the bill. And the restaurants are doing extremely well in this town. And hopefully, as we see other communities uh, develop this uh, this concept, and uh, years from now we become more com more comfortable as a community with this. I do think this can be a good source of revenue for us, but it's desperately needed. And we have capital needs in this community that we're not even discussing. We're going to ask taxpayers in the fall for 150 million dollars in capital needs for a public safety building that we desperately need, for a foster school that is falling down. We're not even talking about the South Hingham Fire Station yet. We're not even talking about more school uh, needs that we have. We are trying to save property tax increases coming down the road. Mary pointed out um, uh, a major override is coming in the fall. So please work with us going forward. We're going to continue the discussion, but thank you for the comments tonight. Thank you, Bill. Um, there should not be a presumption that the real estate tax is the only source of, of tax available to the town. Um, it's not just Hingham, but, but towns throughout Massachusetts. We, there's the real estate tax. There's also motor vehicle excise tax. Um, those towns that have hotel, hotels, there are hotel accommodations taxes. There's the meals tax. There's the recreational marijuana tax uh, that's, been, that's imposed in various towns. So it is very common and very acceptable for towns to be looking for sources of revenue in addition to the real estate tax. I think we need to craft something that is fair, that is equitable, and that will bring in appropriate revenue to the town. Uh, but we should not be focusing solely, in my view, on the real estate tax as the sole vehicle for, for funding town operations. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next proposal. Um, I, I was gonna say, Liz, is, is your group gonna come up with the next proposal or are we going to uh, figure out uh, a new group to put it together? I don't, I don't want to, uh, to put the burden on you, but uh, I've heard members of your task force express their willingness and their commitment to the town. Uh, to keep the task force going. And I think this would be uh, an appropriate use, uh, but I'm not gonna ask for an answer now, but we are gonna focus on it. The select board is gonna focus on it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we intend to bring this again uh, and to get the input from the advisory committee uh, and from residents of the town to figure out how we can move forward. So thank you for this um, and I, Tom, we do not have a vote for this, but I think we do need a vote because uh, I believe it's the consensus uh, of the members of the select board to remove Article GG uh, from the warrant. That's what I would recommend you do, yes. So, um, so then I would make a motion to remove Article GG from the warrant. 
before that seconded, I think we need a motion to open the warrant, then to remove article GG, and then to close the warrant. Uh, so I will amend your motion bill to so state. Is there a second? Second. We do a roll call vote. Bill. Aye. Liz. Aye. And Joe. Aye. Um, so GG uh, is off, uh, but it is, it is gone, but not forgotten. And um, at this point, um, I am not sure whether or not the advisory committee would be uh, adjourning their group um, as we move to the next item, which is the uh, Article F, the budgets. Thanks, Joe. Yes, advisory committee is going to go into recess and we will reconvene in our ADCOM meeting Zoom link that's on our agenda after we just take a couple minutes break. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a minute. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda is a discussion of the um, 2022 annual town meeting warrant article, which is currently called Article F, uh, which is our budget. Um, and again, I'm going to first turn this over to Tom and Michelle, and then the select board will take this up. Sure. So, Joe, would you like Michelle to bring up the spreadsheet? Yeah, that'd be great. So while Michelle is doing that, I can uh, just remind everyone that all of these budgets have the department heads have come before uh, the select board over the past few months and presented their budgets uh, to you. And this is the, the culmination of that effort. And, uh, and it's now time to consider um, what we want to recommend for town meeting. So that's tonight's, that's tonight's goal. And the spreadsheet that we sent around that's before you has the final department request. Any additional items requested with some, some notes here about what those items are and the town administrator's recommended priority, which is also on a separate tab that I can switch to at any time. And then a total select board recommended column here. And if you'd like to make any adjustments or changes, we can do that tonight. Okay. Um, what would be helpful uh, I believe is to highlight um, the priorities that uh, Tom, you have for your requests um, so that as we review the budget, we understand um, what you think is the most important. Um, and so I believe the first one is um, for elections, additional pull pad and software. Yes. And Michelle, if you can just highlight that on the screen. Where, where are we here? On this sheet or on the other sheet? Uh, on the other sheet. That would be right here. Okay. Um, so this is looking to add uh, $1,875. And could you explain, Tom or Michelle, why you believe this is a priority? Sure, this was a request made by the town clerk and it's an additional pull pad for an additional um, voting uh, sec uh, section down in Linden Ponds. Something that we had not traditionally had and, uh, and I felt that it was a, while a very small amount of money, I'm trying to be true to the, to the point of any new requests being, being identified as, identi as additional requests. And so am I correct that you've identified this as something that's um... Uh, important in terms of making sure that uh, elections run smoothly and that people are, are voting uh, in a proper manner? I would say this is the core of what government does. Yes, and is subsequently necessary. Okay. Um, Liz, any, any questions on this? I mean, it's a, it's a small amount of money, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But just so we understand, is it required for Linden Ponds to be a voting precinct? Yes, we, we'll, we'll need this poll pad. Uh, and whether it's funded through this way or another, I, I don't know how, would, how I would do it otherwise, but Carol has told us she needs this. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Got it. 
Um, Bill, any questions? Uh, just briefly, uh, so, uh, and I don't know if you know, I remember Carol talking about this. So it's a pole pad, but it's it's one pole pad and it covers the entire town and all precincts. I, th I thought it was just for one precinct. Oh, it's just for the one precinct, is yes. that right? Yes, it's just an additional pole pad, yeah. Right, for the Lynn, at Linden Pines. Yeah. I remember Carol saying it was very important to her, so I, I, I recall. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Tom, I'm going to, or, or Michelle, um, in terms of the added recommendations, and we're not yet voting on this, but I, I would ask you to, to put it in here so that's reflected in the, in the total. Okay, um, what is your second priority? Priority two was a sustainability coordinator. This is a position that I'm proposing to share with the towns with the town of Cohasset in a one third for Cohasset, two thirds for Hingham um, uh, basis, where we would receive two thirds of the hours worked by the by the employee. Um, this work has been identified by a number of groups um, and and verified by Michelle and Art and I in my office that is critical to our efforts to um, to maintain the. Uh, the sustainability of our community. And that covers any one of a number of, of categories um, from resiliency uh, to energy use and energy efficiency, uh, renewables, et cetera. And I think that, you know, this person would help us um, in very critical ways, in my opinion, uh, by allowing us to understand the ways in which we could uh, tackle some of those problems effectively. And that might include um, uh, identifying new grant opportunities that we um, we in general government may not be aware of or or uh, or have the bandwidth to seek. So I think that this is a, a critical hire. Am I, would this person be working only on the town only for the town side or also for the schools? Is it is it really town wide? I just don't understand the scope of the of the job here. Sure, great question. This would be a, a, a town wide effort that would be being made. So not li limited to the municipal side, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's right. This would cover the uh, school buildings, school work, um, uh, the town buildings, town hall, et cetera. Uh, any, um, any opportunities for sustainability in town, uh, this position would help us identify. Got it. Liz, any questions on this? So this position, um... I, we've heard a lot of support from the community. I, I think it's really critical to um, implementing the climate action plan. I guess just a question on timing. It, does this person need to come on, um, you know, kind of immediately in FY23 or um, it, it, would this person come on after the consultant's work is done with the climate action plan? Just trying to understand that dependency. Sure. So I didn't. I don't see this as a as their depend as a dependency. There, I think that okay. we have the work to start those folks out with right now, or this this position out with right now. However, they will be in large part guided, I imagine, by the um, by the findings from that report. But there is a significant amount of work that could be tackled immediately. Okay. And, and Tom, just following up on Liz's question, is that the expectation of the other town that we be we we would yes. be sharing this position with? Yes, and, Cohasset is expecting this as a January, as a July one start. Okay, Bill. Uh, so I, I don't have any comments, Joe, but we're going to be able to, to to discuss this when we're when Tom's done, correct? I'm sorry. I don't have any specific questions, but we're going to be able to um, discuss the proposals when he's done, correct? Uh, well, for these proposals, um, for, like for the top two, I wanted to make sure that that we understood his priority, and then have the questions on this, um, on these positions and asked and answered now. Okay, got it. Yeah, I just wanna make sure I, so yeah, okay. I, I just wanna make sure we're gonna discuss, I don't have any questions. Okay. Got it. Um, so Michelle, if we were to, I, I wanna keep a running total because um, we're spending money beyond the zero, um, beyond what we have. Um, so if we 
if we did this combined with the other one, what what are what are we up to? We would be up to forty nine eight seventy five. Okay. Um, Then um, I guess picking up Bill on what you were saying, I'm, I'm wondering if what we want to do at this point, because we, we, we've got your we've got your top two, and, and there may be others that we want to consider. Um, but now start going through the budget uh, as a whole, not not yeah. focusing only on these, and then um, and, and then seeing where we come out. Um, the, the danger of going that route. So the, the next one that we don't have here is is the grant writer, um, but that's that is a priority number four. So I I don't even want to be talking about whether or not it's it's worth it until we understand what priority number three is, and then we've got to do a, a balancing act between how much we're spending and then the marginal cost of the next edition. Got um, it. Joe, can I make a suggestion? Sure. So if you, Michelle, if you go to the other tab, if you had those those discussions, Joe, from this yeah. page, yeah, that might make some sense, and then you can you we can flag which ones you'd like us to add onto the next, right? Okay, uh, onto the other page, and then we can go through and take right. those votes. So so your your priority number three, which is so we I think we've we've discussed the, the top two. Um, I, I'm, before we finish on the stop to so the sustainability coordinator, what is our share? Oh, forty-eight thousand dollars. No, no. Is it two thirds, one third, or two thirds? Yep. Okay, got it. Um, and so the next one is the uh, part-time office assistant with the Ware River water system. Uh, why is that a priority, Tom? Sure. So right now we have the intention is that this position will sit upstairs um, outside of the Ware River water system director's office and outside of the town engineer's office. And um, the, the available location is directly between those two, those two offices. So it's a unique opportunity to share a position. The Weir River Water System does have this in their budget and they will be funding a part-time office assistant with that budget. I've asked them to hold off until this, uh, this process is complete to see if there's an opportunity to uh, instead hire a full-time position partially paid by Weir River and partially paid by the town. Um, what, I ident what I've identified, and the reason I've identified this as my number three priority is because the town engineer right now is in essence a one person, um, a one person role. Uh, J.R. Fry is an outstanding town engineer. However, he has no support. Uh, he is working on our wharfs. He's working on uh, all of our building projects, the entire road building, um, schedule. Uh, he does uh, work for the permitting boards. He's before the permitting boards on all of our projects. Uh, and he does a lot of support work for CPC, um, which this position would be able to help um, help provide assistance to. There are a a number of a number of um, important roles that the town engineer is actively engaged in. And I worry that things will slip through the cracks despite JR's best efforts. And, and I think that having a part-time um, office assistant dedicated to that role, that and CPC, will help us to, um, to ensure that that doesn't happen. What percent of the salary is covered by um, the water company? 50. So this is a 50-50 a split? Yes. And so the 26366 represents the town's share of that. that that's right. Um, and is there a reason that, um, I like Liz's question, is there a reason that we need to move, move forward this coming fiscal year with this person? The reason for that is that we'll be hiring the Weir River Water System part-time assistant um, immediately uh, or as immediately as we can. I was hesitant to do that because I think the, um, the hiring process would be better served if we 
could tell the applicants whether this was a full-time or part-time position. I think we would have a very different, different applicant pool depending on full-time or part-time position. So I've asked um, Russell uh, Tierney to hold off on hiring his part-time assistant until we made this decision. And if we make this decision to fund it through town meeting, then he would hold off until, um, well, we would start the, start the hiring process in June, but we, would, uh, we wouldn't hire uh, until July 1. Okay. Um, Liz, questions? I don't have questions about this one. Um, I, I, I think J.R. Fry is, has He's a fried. lot on his plate. He's fried. Where yes. it's, it's, uh, I'm worried. So if yep, this yep. Help, helps, obviously assistant Tom engineer is number eight, but if, if this is a way to help him, um, I, I, think, I think that's, it yep. serves the town well. Bill. Yeah, I mean, I would share Liz's sentiment. If this avoids having to get number eight and saves us $85,000 at eight, then I think this is could be money well spent. So. Yeah, and, and I guess I'm concerned that to the extent that um, the town engineer is not able to address certain projects uh, to the extent that they need to be addressed, the town suffers. Um, just not only in the quality of work, but things that get missed. So um, I, I agree. Um, so Michelle, if you add that number and put it in. So we're now at 76,241. Um, I'll just tell you, I, we are reaching the limit for me um, of how much I wanna spend in addition to uh, the level service budget. Um, which is not a reflection on the fact that we've got a lot of needs, uh, but um, recognizing that there is a hole. Uh, every dollar we spent makes it larger. And it's not just for this coming fiscal year, it builds each fiscal year after that. So I, we can continue, but I, I just wanna express my view that um, we're, we're a, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about going beyond this. Um, the next one, um, Tom, which is the part-time grant writer. Sure, this is a this is a position that um, you know Michelle and I regularly hear from advisory committee and others in town that a grant writer would offer. It's believed that a grant writer could pay for themselves. I don't doubt that. I think that there are a lot of grant, uh, especially a part-time grant writer, um, that there are a lot of grant opportunities out there. Um, some of them more competitive perhaps than, than uh, folks want to believe, but I do think that there's opportunity for, for additional grants for the town to get. Um, I will point out that uh, with, uh, as promised, when we hired um, our, our second ATA last year, that position is in fact doing some, uh, some additional grant writing. As a matter of fact, um, Art has taken on the role of um, of liaison to the green communities program, and has uh, has received well, never mind. Uh, he's doing good things with the green communities program. Uh, we're we're not allowed to talk about that uh, process that program just yet. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so some good things are happening there, and so that is being fulfilled. However, uh, you know, more more expertise and more work from grant uh, from that dedicated grant writer would presumably produce more grants for the town. Um, whether or not I can say that it definitively would pay for itself, I, I don't know. Um, I think that there's a, a decent chance that could, and that's why I have it high, um, prioritized as highly as I do. Are you anticipating this as an employee or as an independent contractor? And um, this, this model would be an employee. This would be a permanent employee, part-time, permanent part-time employee. Yep. Is, is there an opportunity to have this outsourced to companies that do grant writing is some sort of contractor basis. Um, and I don't know how they function in terms of re remuneration, but you know, if they are paid based mm -hmm. on their success, um, then uh, we're really not out of pocket uh, as long as there's an appropriate uh, contingent fee, if you will, um, for that. So um, I, I have been a supporter of making sure that we apply for grants and of getting, you know, grant applications in. Uh, and to the extent we need resources, we should use them. 
Um, um, I'm hesitant at this stage where we're in a hole to be um, bringing on another employee. Uh, Liz, your thoughts? I agree with you, Joe. And I, I think there are opportunities here to use contract resources. Um, so that coupled with, I know Art has been doing a great job um, looking at different grant programs. And my expectation is that the sustainability coordinator would be working with grants as well or seeking out grants. So um, that may be a way to just kind of move uh, in a, fa a phased approach with this. And then, yep. you know, perhaps next year to consider bringing on a part-time or even full-time grant writer. Yeah, it's a great point, Liz. I'd yep. say that there's a high likelihood that the green communities program that art has been shepherding for the last year um, would likely move to the sustainability coordinator if that position were hired, um, thereby freeing him, him and his time up to do more of this in other places. So mm -hmm. th that's just yep. a great good point. Bill. Do I would agree with you that given where we are looking at next year, a $5.8 million deficit, um, I'm not going to be comfortable going beyond three here. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm not going to be comfortable with number four. I, and, and quite honestly, I'm just to give you my insight into this, you know, the, the, this deliberative process here, I, I'm not going to be comfortable with go. I mean, if this is, if this is Tom, if this is your order of merit list and these are your priorities. Yes, it is. I am happy to, to start discussing one, two and three. Now um, we've, we've heard one through 14 already, and I'm happy to continue to listen and, and, he, and, and hear the advocacy for these, for, for, for four through 14, but um, I'm also happy to start talking about one through three and see where we are in terms of consensus there too, Joe. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll follow your lead. Okay. So um, I, I think Bill, your point is, is well taken. Um, I wanted to really get the very top priorities uh, of the town administrator addressed. Um, and then I would ask Tom, if there are others, I know you've got them in priority order, but if there are others that you wanna call out um, and if you do call them out, uh, I'd like to hear why you think it's essential that they happen this year or in the, in, you know, in the upcoming budget as opposed sure. to- Sure, so I, I don't believe there's any others that are essential for this, for this year's budget. Um, these, I call them out and I highlighted them and put them in as additional requests because these are, these are in some places, um, the, the firefighters, the police officers, these are things that the town is going to have to do. Um, we are undermanned and uh, in, say, in, in some capacities, we are, we're working in unsafe ways. And I think we need to consider increasing the minimum manning both in our, well, in our fire department and then uh, and also adding a, another police officer across each of the three shifts. So that's why those are in there. I don't believe that has to happen this year. Um, you know, as we look at the, the pressures on the budget, I, I, I agree with the assessment that, that you guys are talking about right now. I would say that um, just to call it out, the paramedic school tuition, you know, that's, that's something that I'm hopeful um, that is going to be needed, we believe. However, I'm hopeful, and I think the chief is as well, that our new um, uh, pay scale is, is, can, can affect our ability in a positive way to attract new firefighters, which is what that is intended, that line item is intended to, to cover uh, in case we had to start hiring EMTs instead of paramedics. However, um, we're hopeful that that's not going to come to fruition. Um, and then the last, the, the, you know, we talked about the assistant town engineer. I do think that that is a scenario that, that may be needed, but I agree with your seeming collective wisdom about the um, office assistant um, and that ability to take, as I like to say, some steam out of the kettle for JR. And then we can assess, right? We can see where things are next year. Uh, at this time, after uh, after that position is in place, and whether or not it will um, it will assist them and to, to him to an extent that perhaps the assistant town engineer may not be needed. Um, but right now, my assessment it, it was. But again, uh, having that that office assistant now um, would be a, a great starting point. So I I'm in full agreement with your assessment of these top three. Okay. Um... 
Joe, can I just make a comment yeah. or ask a question about the um, the assistant town engineer? It would be nice to understand, Tom, if there's a way for you and or JR to articulate things that he, projects he just does not have the bandwidth to do and what that sure. means in terms of, it's it costs time and money, right? So just so we have a sense of not adding that person means X in terms of these number of projects just could not physically be done. I think that helps us build the case for next year. Sure, I can do that, yep. I will say anecdotally when I call him, I'm, you know, I, this is my my life, but I regularly call him. Unfortunately, after hours on weekends, he's always answering the phone with his with his young family climbing on him, and uh, and he he's he just is a nonstop, very hard worker, uh, very dedicated. But to your point, Liz, that's not that's right. not tenable for forever. Right. So. These FTEs aren't based on a hundred hours a week, or should it <laughs> that's be? Exactly right. right. So. <laughs> that's right. Um, and to what extent are we outsourcing? Um, engineering type projects that once we have this person, we'd be able to keep in house? Yeah, that's a good question. I couldn't quantify that, Joe. I will say um, that there are a number of uh, projects that are outsourced to outside engineers. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that we talked about when we remade the engineering department a few years ago was that we wanted to use um, we wanted to use uh, Project um, project management engineering firms uh, on, on a more frequent basis, and rather than having that those projects managed with internal staff, um, we haven't had too many of those projects where that's come up yet. But that's starting now with <laughs> with a couple of um, well, certainly we, not that we would have had our town engineer manage Foster or the public safety facility, but those types of projects, right? That's where uh, that's where we would certainly see those savings. Yep, and you know, I'm I'm thinking about the wharf wall projects, yeah. uh, climate resiliency projects uh, that are going to be coming online uh, mm -hmm. and they need to be done right. Um, so I think this is down the road, but I, I think given where we are financially, I would not move forward with that this year. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so uh, Liz or Bill, are there any other particular items that you want to press on? No, uh, no questions, but I'm happy to, to advocate uh, when you're ready. Okay, Liz. Could you just remind me what the, um, the townwide turf maintenance that was sure. the landscaping around the fences or something? That's right. So this is, uh, so last year we have, a, we have a program now in place that's working wonderfully on the fields mm -hmm. in town. Um, what in the courts, et cetera, what this, what this does is provides for the apron, if you will, around those fields. So weed whacking around the fences, around the benches, making the, um, making those facilities, uh, just in general, more, more appealing and more, um, more enjoyable for the people that are using them. I will say that, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll once again, enter into con conversation with, with the DPW department about potential for some overtime perhaps to, to cover these things within their budget um, in the short term until this can be figured out how to deal with it long term. But uh, but I'll speak with uh, Superintendent Sylvester and, and, and try to figure some of this out for next year if it doesn't get funded. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, if that not funding that derails that whole maintenance program we need to know that yeah I, so define derail but i don't believe it will i mean the okay. the, the the those fields are are going to be they are now and will continue to be in excellent condition and like i said it's just kind of that outside apron around them um you know that that we need to pay a little bit of more attention to um, okay. i do believe that there's probably a way to do that some of that this coming year perhaps not a permanent solution but uh but something that we can we can work through for the coming year. Okay, great, thank you. I, I, Liz, I think I think where you're going in terms of derailing is that there is now a unified arrangement uh, and we wanna make sure that um, town fields, school fields, th that, that our obligations uh, for maintenance are not gonna be impaired if we don't proceed with this. And I think that's where Liz was going. I wanna make yeah. sure, Tom, that you're in agreement with that. Yeah, no, I understood, and and I and I am in agreement with that. It's what I meant was, 
Um, and ex if there was an expectation that the entire apron was going to be done with the existing maintenance field pro pro within the ma existing maintenance field, got it. Okay. Uh, our maintenance allocation, then that would not happen. But I do believe we can we can find a way through this next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. So before we go to a, a vote, I'm going to ask if there are members of the public who have questions about any of these requests um, and uh, we will do our best to respond. So questions. I am seeing none. Um, uh, Joe, I think no, uh, John Borger is. Has oh, I'm sorry. John, I did not see you. I apologize. Uh -huh. uh, John Borger, 53 Lafayette Avenue. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I, I just briefly, I just want to say um, uh, we really appreciate the priority you've given to the sustainability coordinator. Um, you know, a number of um, Ingham entities, committees, civic groups have lined up behind this. So uh, it's gratifying to see it on the, the top three. We appreciate it very much. We understand the tremendous pressure you're working under. And uh, we in Hingham Net Zero will do everything we can to work with uh, whatever staffing we end up with, including art and uh, the sustainability coordinator um, and the, the light plant as well, importantly. So we'll, we'll make it work one or the other, but thank you. Great, thank you. Any other members of the public? So John, if you can put your hand, there we go, great. I am seeing no other hands. Uh, so I am prepared to move to a motion. Um, and uh, Michelle, can you go over to the other tab? Um, and you have these three items filled in. I see the first, the second, and right. Okay. Um, so what I would suggest we do is do a motion um, to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget uh, as follows, and then we, I would just go to the line under the select board total recommended for each of the categories. So the first one would be for the select board, $854,851. Um, human resources, what are you doing here, Liz? I mean, Michelle. I'm just double checking that these are actually in there. Okay. Thank okay. You. $854,851 for human resources, 168,942. Um, the reserve fund of 709,291. Town accountant of 396,985. Information technology, 633,138. Assessors. Joe, do you mind if I just, uh, you call out 985, it's actually 965 on that other one. I just wanna make sure that the record. Um, where did I go here? Where are we? I'm sorry, town accountant. Town account is an extra twenty bucks. Town, <laughs> town account is three ninety six nine sixty five. Yes. Now you had uh, said nine eighty five. Yeah. I just oh, didn't I'm want sorry. to give you that. Uh, to get that extra twenty bucks. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you're right. I do not want to give you extra. Okay. <laughs> Information technology was. Michelle, let me ask. Can you make this just slightly larger? Yes. Just hit the uh, the zoom function larger for larger print. Hang on one second. Oh, the, uh, this. A little Oops. zoom in there. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay. Want one more? No, that's good. We'll find out how good it is. Um, information, <laughs> information technology uh, six thirty three one thirty eight. Assessors forty uh, four hundred thirty one thousand. For treasurer collector four fifty one three fifty nine. Legal services three hundred ninety five thousand three hundred seventy two. Town meeting forty six six fifty three. Um, I'm just gonna stop for one second. Does that include our um, a special town meeting in the fall? No, it does not. That would be a reserve fund transfer if that, I assume we will do it, but um, okay, we have so not. That, that, we would that. not typically budget that, got it. Right. Town clerk, 
move your cursor. Oh, that's my cursor. I'm sorry. Uh, it was, uh, it's 20, uh, 205, 241, elections 51, 026, Conservation Commission 234, uh, 406, um, community planning 260376, land use and development 163294, Bear Cove Park 33528, uh, Town Hall 710184, Grand Army Memorial Hall 24187,000. So I will make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote. Liz, you're muted. Aye. Bill. Aye. Joe. Aye. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to move uh, to public safety, and I'm going to do police department separate because I believe Bill is going to recuse from that vote. Rec yeah, Joe, if you could pu public safety and recreation, I need to recuse as well. Okay. So uh, at this point, um, I Thank will you. Do, yep, I'll Good do a motion day. for uh, the police department. Um, just one second here. Um, so this is uh, to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget um, is the motion for the uh, police department of 7,187,189. Is there a second? Second. We do a roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Joe. Aye. And the record will show that Bill Ramsey has abstained. Uh, we can now move to um, the next part. Liz, do you want to take over on this? Or do you want me to continue? <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep going, Jeff. Okay, I'll keep going. So I will, um, I'm going to get some sort of battle pay for this. Okay, so now I'll uh, make a move to recommend a fiscal year 23 budget as follows for the following categories. Uh, fire department, 7,171,768. Um, uh, dispatch services, 991,420. Building commissioners, commissioner, 278,751. Animal control, 81,896. The harbor master, 307,880. Um, and public safety utilities, 558, 251. Is there a second? Second. Okay, roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe, aye. Um, I'm, we have not gone over the school part, so I'm gonna move past that right now and we'll go back. Um, and we're gonna start with, so Bill, you need to, recuse yourself on what part of, is it public works or? Uh, no, just to uh, hang and rec, recreation. Oh, we're not there yet. Okay. Okay, Okay. so um, I will stop before we get there. So I'll move to recommend a fiscal year 23, but uh, 2023 budget as follows for these categories. Um, And I just want to be clear, the highway recreation tree and park is not something that you need to recuse yourself, Bill? No, because no, the, the highway recreation is the division of the of DPW. So no, I don't need to do okay, that Okay, good. Um, so it's, uh, why did you change that category, Michelle? I don't think it's usually called that. I think it's usually DPW slash highway That's tree what and I park, thought. but I don't okay. want it to be confusing. Okay, so highway uh, tree and park, uh, that's four, four million three fifty four oh eighty seven. Uh, landfill recycling, one million seven thirty eight one ninety five. The sewer commission, uh, three million seven oh three oh forty one. Um, I'll, that concludes public works. I'll take a second on that. Second. Roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. Joe. Aye. Move forward now to the next category. Um, okay, so then I will uh, make a motion to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget as follows. Uh, for the health department, 
063. Elder Services, 312 734. Veterans Services, 307 609. Um, Health Imperatives, $2,700. South Shore Women's Center, $3,700. I think we can keep going. Um, unless you want, uh, yeah, we can keep going here. So, um, Library, $2,181,736. And for the rec commission, this is where we need to stop, Bill? Correct. Yes. You oh, know, yes. And actually, Joe, I, I, my apologies. I need to hold on the rec commission and the trustees of the Bathing Beach. Okay, so then um, I'll take a second then on the categories we've just covered. Second. second. Okay, roll call vote. Liz? Aye. Bill? Aye. Joe? Aye. Okay, I'm now going to do a uh, recreation uh, commission. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do the motion first. I move to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget as follows for the recreation committee, recreation Commission 371 227 and the trustees of the Bathing Beach 4672. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote. Liz? Aye. Joe? Aye. And the record will reflect that Bill Ramsey has abstained. We now move to the historical commission. I make a motion to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget as follows. Um, the uh, looks like we're going now to the uh, country club, which is uh, one million. He moved it on me here. Um, Wait, Joe, I think it's historical and celebrations. As I'm well. sorry, I missed that. Uh, the uh, uh, historical commission is uh, that's ninety thousand eight forty six celebrations seventeen thousand five sixty seven. Uh, the country club. Uh, 1,988,015, the Ware River Water System, 12,881,442. Um, the debt service, uh, 5,835,331. Uh, I think we can just keep going. Um, group insurance, uh, uh, 7,071,062. Other post-employment benefits, uh, 1,289,173, contributory retirement, 5,837,513, workers' compensation, 330,000, unemployment, 30,000, mandate, I'm sorry, mandatory Medicare, 1,061,995. Um, and then we have property and liability insurance, 1,114,464. I believe that concludes it. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote. Liz? Aye. Bill? Aye. And Joe? Aye. Uh, Michelle, is there anything below this? Nope, that's it. Okay, so now we return to the um, schools. Uh, to education, we've got the uh, school department. Um, their request is for um, 850609 um, I do not believe we have a priority list of um, requests. Uh, so I, I believe we, we are simply considering a, a whole number. Um, and um, we, we need to address how to, how, how to, how to deal with that total. Um, I mean, one, one thing, Tom, I know that we have done in the past is to seek to maintain some sort of uh, like the 60-40 ratio. Um, and um, if we did that, what would, what would, the, um, what would the, be the amount? Approximately $125,000. Nope, so. No. So it looks like the answer is 100, about $114,000. Um, do you wanna just double check that? Yep, I, th I think that's right. Um, I know that, I'm sorry? Yeah, so that's correct. So it's, it's the 114,361 is, is mm -hmm. the 
um, yeah, you're right. 60 40 ratio. Um, I know that we have gotten, um, at least I've gotten a number of, of comments in terms of making sure that we prioritize um, the arts director um, and Michelle or Tom, do you know um, what the dollar amount would be for that that person or that position, I should say? I believe it's budgeted for FY23 at 120,000. Um, so it would be my recommendation that we go over the 6040 ratio and bump this up from the 114 to the 120 so that we cover that and so that we are assured that at least there is the money in the school budget for um, the fine arts director. Um, that I'm just giving you my preliminary thoughts, uh, Liz and Bill, where, where are you coming out uh, on, on that suggestion? I'll start with Liz. I, I agree with supporting the director of fine arts. We've certainly received a lot of feedback on that um, and, and the need for that in terms of supporting arts education. Um, the numbers of students participating in, in the arts and music program is way down compared to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so that's, that's obviously an issue, plus just not having the coordination at a, a director level. Um, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the 1.7 million um, and how that should be best utilized. Um, I guess I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding that surplus if, if, all, if all 32 positions are filled. Um, which I guess is, is great if we feel like those positions are filled with the right people and we have the surplus, then is that money that we can use for these other positions that have been identified as critical? I guess so, that's, that's the question in my mind from yeah. the earlier conversation. So I, I think um, that to the extent, I, I, I think moving forward, I wanna make sure that we have the, the fine arts director position funded, but I would, if we go forward, I would charge the advisory committee to, in fact, look at the very question that you're asking. Okay. And if their assessment is, there's other money to pay for this, that it doesn't need to be in the budget, then they'll come back to us with that recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, but since we are moving forward now, knowing that it, it, it will go to them, but I wanna at least have that as our starting position uh, to make sure that that position is in fact funded. Um, but I, I appreciate your concern. I think, I think that's, I, I get it. I mean, um, if there's extra money, I think the counselors are valid positions too, right? I mean, I think those were the other, there were guidance counselors at the each, I don't have it in front of me, but in the, at the elementary schools, I believe. Um, yeah, I, again, I don't, I don't have the, the breakdown here and, um, so I guess, what, are, are you saying that it's so it put the 120,000 in and if in fact you don't need it for the fine arts director because it's otherwise funded, uh, use it for something else? It, yes, I mean, if, if that money is available now, I, I would wanna understand why we wouldn't fill those positions now, why we would we? Well, I think, I mean, what I heard from the discussion is that you, you interview, you, you, you know, you got to make sure you get the right persons at, of and, course. and now may not be the time to do it. So I, I would not uh, second guess the school committee's judgment about when to bring folks on. Um, uh, understood. Understood. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ramsey. So, uh, yeah, so I guess my bottom line is I, I agree with funding the position at the 120. So. Uh, I, th I think we've heard from a number of people who want the position. I'm somebody who, when I went through Hingham High School, I, I very much benefited from concert band and in many ways. So I know it's a wonderful program and I think it's something we should fund. And it's, we've, we've been hearing about it for many years. So uh, I'm for it 100%. Uh, to Liz's point and to Nancy McDonald's point as well, I'm just trying to figure out how, how we got the surplus. And I know, 
you know, I thought I heard John Farrow say that the 32 positions have all been filled. So I, I'm trying to figure out how this, how we have a $1.7 million surplus. And, and I know Kerry said that you can't carry the money over. And, and I get that point. I'm just trying to figure out how we can't use the money this year to hire a fine arts director. Um, but, you know, I guess we'll leave that to advisory to kind of go through it and figure out in the budget. But if the 30, if all 32 positions are filled with, with the, with the 1.7 surplus come from. So Bill, I, I think what we heard is there's several more months left in the year. We don't know it, in fact, what the dollar amount of that surplus is going to be. Okay. Um, and you know, Oh, it's so, projected. It, it was projected and it, yeah. it was a clear caveat. It could be less or it could be more. Um, that was, I, I guess, a best guess at this point um, without a commitment. Um, and um, I think we need to be sensitive to the financial position we're in. And I also am sensitive to the fact that the schools are going through a strategic planning process. And um, I, I just question how wise it is for us to fund substantial positions prior to the completion of that process. Uh, and it, it, that's, I think, you know, one of the reasons that we did not do an override for this year is we need to know what the number should be. Um, and I don't want to, you know, it, 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 it will, you know, we, we need to let the process play out and I don't want to um, figure that out one way or the other right now. Um, make it make sense, Bill. Well, I'm 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 not sure what you're getting at. I said I said I was for funding the, yeah. the 120. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm okay. just trying to figure out the, the sur surplus, but right. But, okay. Yeah, I I mean I I agree with you, Joe. I think we're all waiting for the the outcome of the strategic plan as well as the staff audit. Um, I guess my only point is if there are critical needs, especially from a counseling perspective at the elementary level, I'd rather have those positions filled now, even if we say next year, oh, we don't need them anymore. Like if there are children in need and we have $1.7 million, that just feels like we should act sooner rather than later. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I totally agree. And, but I, I think, you know, Putting the 120 aside for the fine arts director is, is, is great. And, you know, it's something that we've been hearing about for, for years. And um, it's a great program. And I think it's something that would be benefit the schools and the students very much. So, so I'm fully supportive of it. So, Bill, did I hear you say you were in the band? I was. And, you know, and it's, it's something I benefited from tremendously in life. You know, the confidence of, you know, playing an instrument and being in the band. It's, it was a wonderful experience for me. So I know that students um, benefit from the program in many, many ways. What was your instrument? I played the trombone. Great. <laughs> You'll yeah. have to give us a rendition at some point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'll accept uh, comments or questions from the me members of the public on, on this on this point. I see Liza. Uh, yes, th thank you very much. And I, I just wanted uh, Liza, to- oh. just, I'm sorry, just before you do, I just- um, do Oh, we do have, I have to identify myself? Well, I, I know you are, but uh, I, I wanted to know if we had a, do we have a quorum of the, I know the school committee is not there. I just want to understand- No, if we have, um, I think it's just Ness and is Jen still on? Yes. Yeah. So I think it's just three of us. Oh, great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sorry um, to interrupt. So uh, Liza O'Reilly, 19 Porters Cove Road. So I just wanted to give you a very top line of the variance. Um, so we had some in, in personnel, we had some movement variance. Um, so we had a very good hiring season of being able to hire the people at lower salaries than had right. budgeted. Also, I, I would like to also say, the budget was established a year ago. <laughs> and so we had, you know, there's just changes in any budget of anticipating where we're going. And we've had the, you know, the pandemic is still been going on for us this year. So we had a good hiring season 
which meant that all the people that we had on board to either replace or the new positions, we were able to hire them at favorable rates. Um, we also had some delays in hiring people because it was very difficult to get school staffing. We've also had challenges with getting substitutes and replacing people. And so we haven't had costs, you know, not so great for the kids, but we haven't been able, we didn't have to pay substitutes because we couldn't get them. So those are some of the staffing variations that occurred. Um, we also had, I'm just reading the, the list from John, some underspent contracts. Um, in special education, the big reduction in the fiscal year 23 budget of the students aging out of the out of placement um, tuitions, those actually began somewhat this year. And so then the anticipated tuitions this year, it turned out to be lower. Um, so that was a savings. And then as John had mentioned, we applied grant money to some things that we had budgeted to use up the grants. So then the budgeted money was still there. We also were forced to use our own transportation for special education transportation because we couldn't get transportation from the outside services. And so that ended up being a savings. Um, however, we were over budget on energy costs and we don't know how that's gonna go the rest of with energy costs, especially considering what's happening in the world right now. So those are some of the major top line reasons for this fluctuation. And also of you know what we shared with you earlier, we just learned about this yesterday. Yeah, no. And so we have a lot to sort out and we are talking about, and we do want to work with the town of how could we use yeah. this excess to apply the next year. Um, but I greatly appreciate your commitment to the fine arts director because that is something that we've also heard tremendously from the community and it is something that's, that's critical. Um, but I will say that the administrative functions that we're asking for are similar to the challenges that you have with your staff that not having those administrative functions is detrimental to the operations that we have. And so, um, but we understand, you know, you need revenue to cover things. So that's part of what we'll be looking at when we evaluate this and hopefully tomorrow night with the ACES meeting, we can have a discussion because also we have to post a meeting for all of us to be able to talk and because of the time crunch, fortunately, the ACES meeting is posted for tomorrow. So hopefully we can get through a lot of that discussion tomorrow um, and get further down the path. So I hope that helps with understanding, but I'll um, ask John Ferris to send all of you more information about what he shared with us yesterday too. Liza, that was exceptionally helpful. So thank you. I, I just have just a follow up question. Was any of the 1.7, I guess, funds, um, I'll call it savings, uh, attributed to decreased enrollment in, in the schools so that there were basically, you know, less kids to educate so you, you could realize some cost savings there? Um, not really. And I guess I'm going to challenge you back on that point that it's really sad that we lost these kids in our district and that these families chose to go somewhere else and that we should be doing everything we can to get them back as opposed to looking at the decrease of losing 400 students as just a cost savings and what's the benefit of the cost savings we don't have to educate as many kids. So um, I'm trying to look at it and I, I, I do look at it in my responsibilities of are there cost savings? I don't believe there are because, um, or that was already built in, or 
I'm not really sure. We didn't look at that. But going forward, I'd really like the town to look at how do we get these kids back and what do we need to do to get them back? I think the bulk of them left in the middle school ages and, and early high school. And so I don't believe those students are necessarily, necessarily going to come back because they will have been established in their new school or their new community. Um, and it, it would be unlikely for them to come back. We have seen that at the elementary level, they are coming back, kindergarten, first grade, those those numbers are higher. I don't know where birth rates are going these days, but um, that enrollment's coming back. But oh. um, you know, I think in the long run, we do have to really look at ourselves and consider how do we how do we get back to our glory days? Yep. So I I will just. Uh, but how, we'll, how, how we, I'm sorry. Go we'll ahead. Look at that. Um, I, I would just one thing I will add. To this is that the 400,000 that is already applied to the um, federal dollars to balance the budget is part of this 1.7. Yep. So, um, so it's really not the whole, I mean, that's part of moving it all around and figuring it all out too. So I, I just would, not characterize what you said as a challenge to what I said. I was asking an accounting question yeah. as to whether or not it was, a, I wasn't saying it was a good thing or a bad thing. And it, I should not be characterized that way. Okay. Uh, I just want to understand how, how the dollar amounts came out. Yeah, um, I, I get that and I, I appreciate that, but I've heard it from other people and maybe it's coming across as accounting, but then the more I think about it, I'm like, we shouldn't only think about it from an accounting standpoint, we should think about it of the values of our community as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But that's not inconsistent with the position I've been taking. Yep, um, I appreciate that. Uh, I see Doc Gallo, good to see you. You are still muted. Um, Again, I'm, okay. There we go. Great. So, uh, thank you, Dorothy Gallo on Volunteer Road. I don't want to repeat anything that anybody said on this topic and certainly don't intend to comment on the music director or the finance director or any of the other things on the list. That's not my role. But I think I would like to add my way of thinking about um, this surplus. In fact, I am not going to use that word anymore in this brief conversation because it's just the wrong way to think about this amount of money. This amount of money is unexpended funds from the FY22 budget. And at this point, it's simply a projection with you know a third of the year still to go um, on costs that uh, could come up. It, it's a, a larger amount than typically would occur, but there are two or three sort of caveats there. One is that um, the tradition for all town departments is if one doesn't expend the dollars that were appropriated by town meeting in one year, last year, for specific down to the number of people and the number of garments and the number of pencils and all of that, those dollars are part of the um, number of dollars that were appropriated for very specific things in this budget. And if they're not expended uh, for a variety of reasons, a good hiring season, as Liza suggested, is, is one of the, the, the biggies, intuitions is another biggie, then they're supposed to go back to the town because the town appropriated them for FY for a, a 22, budget 22 for very specific things. If they weren't needed for those things or if some of the costs of those things that would had been projected um, gave us a savings, then, then that's a good thing. 
There are some exceptions to that in the sense that there was a commit the committee that was formed several years ago because we had a really troublesome situation that occurred with some move in students with very heavy duty specific uh, out of district special ed needs and tuitions that threw our budget totally under the bus in uh, in a, a January, late January after the budget had just been presented of a year. So the way that that article that town meeting uh, eventually passed and that um, the legislature uh, took action on was that if there were funds at the end of the year, not surplus funds, but funds that were unexpended for the things that they were intended to be uh, expended for, then dollars from that could by the school committee without action or by advisory or, or by the selectmen, that dollars from that number of unexpended dollars could be appropriated to keep that uh, reserve fund uh, at a level that was limited. We couldn't keep adding to it every year. And we've been fortunate not to have to use it for the fund, the, the expenses. We don't have and have never had a surplus fund. And so I feel really strongly that we need for the community to understand and not be misled into thinking that we have monies that were always overinflated, so there'd be left money left at the end of the year. I think things like that are easy assumptions for people to make because it's a, a complicated concept. So I just feel really strongly that we want to use the appropriate words here and that monies in every department uh, can't simply say, I mean, it's very tempting because here's this, all this apparent money, which may not be here at the end of the year, at least not in that amount. Uh, that we can use it for something else that we need or want, but mostly need, because we always do need space budgets, um, that we can't just expend it for things like that. Um, and so um, I, I it, we have, it's, it's important to be careful when we talk about things like special ed, but you know, 1.7 sounds like a lot of money. A million is obviously a lot of money. But uh, when I last was there, we had a budget year where we had over $1 million in five special ed tuitions, five. Because there were, there were individual tuitions that were over $200,000. And so some amounts of money and some amounts of change uh, of, a, of a change in, in allocations uh, uh, is to be expected, but um, they can be the big, the big things. Um, we'll look what's happening to gasoline. And we're talking about for this year, let alone for next year. You know, we have an amount of money in the budget, in your budget for next year. And we're talking about the rest of this year, what's gonna happen with uh, get, particularly these diesel, uh, diesel fuel. So, so I think to think of this as John's first pass and he does a great job, his numbers are, are accurate. John's first pass at what could be there with what we know now is just that. It's a first pass of a projection. There is a long history. I'm not sure it's law, but it's been, it's been a, a policy and practice in this town that dollars need to go back that were unexpended and they go to the reserve. Um, and there is an exception to that uh, in terms of special ed, which when we do have dollars, then that's not a bad place to to park them until they're uh, until they're needed, and that is uh, has been legally uh, formulated that committee and that amount of money in that language. So, so I wish everybody well. I mean, it's amazing. I I turn on these meetings just to kind of look and peek, and I stay for every meeting for the for the whole meeting because I care about it. But I really care about things that are what what is the right thing to do when there is a right way to manage this unexpended money from a prior year, not just this year, obviously, but every year. 
So thank you. Thank you. And it's really good to see you. Um, I see Ness Carenti. Hi, Ness Carenti, 17 Ward Street. Thanks so much for taking my question. And um, I agree. And it's nice to see you, Dr. Gallo. Thank you for your advocacy and all of your comments. Um, so I think the the questions we were talking about the $1.7 million, I think Liza captured it correctly. Um, again, we still we just got this yesterday, so we're still trying to figure it out. Um, back last year, there were the turn backs of a million dollars, which at the point I remember thinking, I can't believe we're sending that much back. Um, but because of how the ESSER funding happened, it was just the way that it worked that um, we had, we created a budget, we get government funding and we had to, we use that so that we could send back the million dollars. My first year on the committee, we sent back 69,000. And I remember thinking that year it was, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're sending back $69,000. Um, I wish it was as low as that now. Uh, but I wanted to comment on a couple things. Um, because we just got this, one of the questions that I'm going to have on the age outs, that was part of where the 1.7 is coming out of, that is starting to happen this year. So when, when we say the age outs, those are the kids who are in special education who, once they reach 22, we are no longer financially responsible for them. So the age outs started to happen this year instead of what John's projections were for next year. So my question to him is going to be a follow-up question is going to be, does that impact our fiscal 23 budget? Because if it does, if you remember, there was an amount for um, the age outs that was bringing our special ed budget down. Now that we're starting to use that um, and start, some of the kids are starting to age out this year, is that going to then cause our budget for next year to go up? So it's just something that we need to work through. and. We have been hearing from the parents on the um, the fine arts director. I really appreciate you putting that in there. What what the parents don't see, but we are seeing and we feel is the um, the holes in central office. And you know, I, I think we need to talk through that with Aces tomorrow. But uh, you know, I, I made um, a comment once that. Given the fact that Dr. Maestas was going through the system and trying to find out vaccination rates for the kids would be the same as saying to a CEO, can you please go in and do an inventory for pencils? And it's just, it's crazy that that's where we are, but that's where we are. And we've got a lean um, central office. Um, I think doc, Dr. Gallo was doing uh, yeoman's work when she was there and we're trying to um, fill in those those gaps now. Um, but the other question that had come up when you guys were deliberating was the um, adjustment counselors. So there is adjustment counselors at each of the elementary schools um, proposed for fiscal 23. So each one is 74,553. And I did the quick calculation, um, gets to be 235,535. So I just wanted to um, answer all those things that had come up while you guys were deliberating. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jen, Jen Benham. There we go. There we go, thank you. No, I just, um, just quickly just wanted to, you know, thank Dr. Gallo for a comment. Name and address, please. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen Benham, 300 Gardner Street. I apologize. Um, I uh, just want to quickly say thank you to Dr. Gallo for her comments around it being a projection. Um, and I want to reiterate on what Liza said um, regarding the hiring. You know, we're, you know, we've struggled to fill those para positions. Um, that's where, you know, so, some of that money, I guess the savings you would, you would say has been because we haven't been able to fill a lot of those positions and, you know, ideas are continue to be brainstormed on how to increase those positions. Um, and additionally, I just want to add that the ESSER funding, it, it was an overlay to the budget. And because the employees are being charged directly to the ESSER grant accounts, those expenses, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily showing in the um, operating budget. And then lastly, I just wanted to thank you for your kind words and support around the fine arts director position. Uh, you know, community members have pointed out the inequity compared to our sports programs and really need to show, you know, that we value the arts. 
town. I just wanted to help. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other comments. Um, so Michelle, um, on the line for the school budget, uh, can you add on the 120,000 that we've discussed? Yep. And I looked it up. I think it's actually 120 to 40, if you okay. want to be exact. So, um, so you've added in, that's the 122.40 for the fine arts director, correct? Okay. Yes. Um, so at this point, I would uh, make a motion to recommend a fiscal year 2023 budget for the school department of 61,946,743 dollars. Second. Did I hear a second? Uh, yes, I second oh, it. Sorry, okay, uh, roll call vote. Liz. Can I just ask a question, Joe? So will sure. we have a chance to evaluate this after ESIS does their work? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, so um, the our, my expectation is once this, once we do this vote, it goes to advisory committee uh, in, and they will then do, do their due diligence. They're gonna report back uh, on to us in terms of their recommendations. And then uh, based on uh, what ACES informs the ADCOM of, uh, it'll come back to us and we'll have a chance to, to review this. Okay. And it would be my, my strong expectation that we are looking for ADCOM's uh, advice and counsel on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay so we've got this moved and seconded. Any further comments? I will take a roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe. Aye. We have now, believe it or not, at uh, 1033, uh, now concluded um, item number eight on our agenda. Good news is we've already done item number nine, the COVID-19 report, uh, or the COVID-19 update. Um, uh, before I, I'm sorry, bef before I leave this, uh, I, I, I really want to um, thank uh, those, not just the school committee members, but members of the public who've been here. Um, it's, it's, it's been a long hearing and um, your input is just exceptionally valuable. And we, we do appreciate uh, that, that you took the time, uh, stuck with us to this late hour. Um, and we know it's, it's, it's something that's important to you. It's important to us and uh, looking forward to a town meeting where we get this successfully resolved. Um, okay, um, I do not believe that we have any appointments uh, to consider this evening. At this point, I'll accept comments from members of the public on items that are not on the agenda. Are there any members of the public with comments on items not on our agenda? Seeing none, we move to town administrator select board reports. I will start with Tom Mayo. Thank you, Joe. Um, I uh, I just wanted to call out, um, and, and if one of you will do it, then I won't, but I just wanted to call out um, Russ Kahn, uh, who is a, uh, a newly retiring member from the uh, planning, from the personnel board. So I won't do that if one of you is planning to, but. Um, I, I could say that I've I've worked well with Russ for over many years, and uh, and where the town is going to be worse off without him. He is fantastic. He's patient. He's smart. He's a great teacher, um, and I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to miss having him on that board. Um, but Joe, Joe, before I jump into and ask you and turn it back over to you for other town administrative reports, I just wanted to point out I don't know that we've voted the capital budget yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I. Missed that in my uh, vote list. One second here. Um, Is it on the vote list? Let me see. Um, it is. It's the last that. item. Oh, there it is. Um, so, you look it up. So, oh. um, yeah, so this, this would be the vote for the capital outlay recommendations. Ready for motion? I am ready for motion. 
Make a motion to approve the FY23 capital outlay budget as recommended by the capital outlay committee. Second. Roll we'll call the vote, Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe, aye. Tom, thank you for pointing that out. At 1036, by the way, I want an extra yeah. pat in the back for that. Absolutely. <laughs> you deserve it. Um, so, Tom, any, any other anything else that you wanted to add? No, on nothing else. Thank you. Nope. Okay. Michelle. Nothing for me. Thank you. All right. Um, nothing, nothing for me tonight. Thank you. Except you're going to go out and start writing up these grant proposals. That's, that's, that's the message you're getting this evening. Um, Loud and Liz. clear. Okay. <laughs> Liz. Um, nothing really to report, except that while we've been sitting here, the um, Hingham boys hockey team won their game tonight. Ah, so. awesome. Great. Yeah, so that's fun. <laughs> Thank you. Bill. Uh, yeah, I, I was, funny, Liz, I was going to say that the hockey team is still in the tournament and the boys and girls basketball team is still, team is still in the tournament. And it's just, you know, I love driving around town this time of year and seeing the names on the uh, light poles going down Main Street. So uh, go out and support the teams and the tournaments as they go forward. So that's it. Yes. And so, Tom, with respect to Russ uh, Khan, uh, he has not yet retired. He is in through That's the true. end of the fiscal year. So even though he's announced it, uh, I'm going to be uh, making some comments, but I'm waiting till it's closer to his actual retirement. Um, That's a good idea. Because maybe he'll forget and he'll just stay on. So let's not <laughs> let's not remind him that he's leaving. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've learned a lot from him. Uh, the town has benefited significantly from his, from his efforts, from his commitments. Um, but there'll be more to say as we get closer to his um, actual retirement date. Um, and with that, I am prepared at 1038 for a meeting that started at six um, <laughs> to accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And uh, Dr. Gallo, is it okay with you if we adjourn now? Okay. Um, roll call <laughs> vote. Liz. Aye. Bill. Aye. And Joe. Aye.